Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining us for day two of the symposium on removing barriers to access. Uh, so yesterday we had a bunch of great speakers, phenomenal speakers. Uh, today we'll be starting off with our panel discussions. Uh, first up, I want to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Amy Morris, uh, currently serving as a guardsman, who will be moderating our first panel discussion today between Dr. Zvaki and Diamond. So, Dr. Morris. Good morning. Thank you so much, Terrell. Um, as you mentioned, I am Amy Morris. I'm a senior consultant for Veterans Education Initiatives at the Council for Adult and Experiential Learning. And it's my pleasure to moderate our panel discussion this morning. I want to start by introducing our panelists, starting with Dr. Ainsley Diamond. Dr. Diamond is the Director of Faculty Outreach and Engagement in the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning at the University of Connecticut. In this role, she supports university-wide efforts to enhance student learning outcomes by partnering with faculty, administration, and colleges to advance teaching me methodology and provide thought leadership for initiatives which directly impact student success. The author of The Adaptive Military Transition Theory and its representative model, Dr. Diamond is a fierce advocate for military-affiliated students and their families. Ainsley uses her research and experience with the military community to guide her work in policy action, practitioner support, and military student representation in the academy. And next to her, seated is Dr. David Vaki. Um, he's a US Army veteran of 20 years with deployments for operations enduring and Iraqi freedom in the early 2000s, who earned a PhD in higher education administration from UMass Amherst as a student veteran using the post 9-11 GI Bill, in which his dissertation research focused on explaining student veteran success. A nationally recognized author and scholar, David critiques research and models that take a negative view of veterans while leveraging his own scholarly background to demonstrate how veterans succeed despite numerous obstacles to their success. David's been a faculty member or administrator in higher education since 2005 and has developed a veterans boot camp virtual course offered through Fortify Associates and has also provides fraction, yes, fractional veteran services as a consultant for campuses and corporate organizations alike. Let's welcome our panelists this morning. All right, well first, let's start off with some definitions for folks. We know that most folks here are from higher education, um, but we have all kinds of different sectors represented. Um, and so we see, David, institutions of higher learning um, of all shapes and sizes that claim to be veteran friendly. In your research and your experience, what makes an organization or specifically um, a higher education institution veteran friendly? That, that's a great conversation. It's one of the ways that I got started in all of this, people talking about veteran friendly. And um, th there was an interesting definition that was offered back in 2009, and I tweaked it a little bit. And, um, you know, uh, essentially veteran friendly are uh, organizations that um, mitigate or reduce barriers for the success of veterans. And um, it, it's, it's kind of no more complicated than that, except for when you start to think about it, it's much easier said than done because veteran friendliness is almost exclusively an interpersonal experience. And um, as, as we all know, one negative experience has this equal weight of 20 positive experiences. And so um, veteran friendliness is, is very difficult to achieve. It's great to aspire to, um, but I always get the little imaginary question mark above my head when people are running around talking about how we have a veteran friendly business or we have a veteran friendly institution or whatever. And I'm like, okay, we'll see. And, uh, and, and it's usually a mixed bag. Um, it's usually not unveteran friendly, but it's usually less veteran friendly than folks think. And that's okay because I think it's aspirational more than it is achievable. And uh, so to, to revise, it's, it's, it's about mitigating obstacles as best you can to sort of level the playing field. Absolutely, I think we hear some language um, in this space where we're transitioning from veteran friendly to veteran ready uh, and, and making sure your organization is veteran ready. And so the inverse really, what makes a veteran, and this is to both of you certainly, um, what makes a veteran ready for higher education? Um, 
I, I come from the Aston uh, school of thought, uh, inputs plus environment equals outputs. Um, and, and I'm cynical about this sometimes. Some people don't belong in college and it's nothing personal, right? The, the inputs, your academic preparation, you're either ready for college or you're ready to be ready for college. In other words, you can be brought up. Some people can't do college and that's okay because not all, all positions in society re require that. So I think what makes veterans veteran uh, college ready is, is that preparedness. What makes campuses veteran ready, I think are realizing that we're not rolling out red carpets. We're not, you know, trumpet fanfare every time there's veterans everywhere. There are certain unique things about the college experience of veterans, and we just have to make sure that those do not create an imbalance for the veterans. Uh, the biggest example that occurs at, at every campus, and it's, it's never changed since I've been doing this for uh, 12 or 13 years, is veteran benefits. Um, the paradigm, right, wrong, or indifferent, is the military has given me a bunch of money so that I can go to school at low or no cost, and what that should equate to, right, wrong, or indifferent, is a hassle-free financial experience with the institution, and that is most normally not the case. And uh, and so, you know, if you if you want to make your campus vet as veteran ready as possible, the first thing is to make sure that uh, you have a system in place that minimizes the pain of trying to use education benefits that are supposed to make things easy for veterans. And then the second thing is to make sure that the academic experience in the classroom is, um, is at least neutral. Uh, it doesn't have to be veteran friendly, if you will, but it needs to not be veteran hostile in the classroom. And there are many discussions about what that means, and I think everybody understands that. But the fact that someone is a veteran in the classroom is almost not germane and it shouldn't become an issue. And so I think the classroom dynamic along with that financial dynamic, those are the two big things that can make an institution veteran ready. I think that um, <clears throat> a lot of this comes down to informed decision. I mean, we heard Colonel Gadsden yesterday say um, it was something to do. Uh, it, you, the veteran is given uh, these benefits and a lot of times they are told or led by example by peers that, yeah, I've got these educational benefits, I'm just gonna go and use them. And that is terrifying from someone on the inside because it is so much time, it is so much m money. And if you're going into it, not really knowing what, you, what you direction, you don't need a laser beam focus. Yes, I'm going to go get this asso associate degree follow this uh, path to a four-year degree, go on to get a terminal degree. You don't need that, but there needs to be some type of really concrete advising that happens to say, what do you want to do? You know, really let's look at your, your path pre-entry uh, into the military, what you experienced during your service, and what aspects of it translate into academia. Um, the culture shift uh, should never be minimized. But much like the mother or father telling a 17 or 18 year old, I have a 17 year old, um, you are going to become a doctor, you are going to become a lawyer, that student has zero, zero um, interest in moving forward unless they own that. And it takes time. And I think that's the challenge, right? Is it takes time to figure out your academic plan, but you're staring down these benefits and I've got to use them and I've got to do this now because maybe I'm unsure of the path I want to take to move forward. And so this is something that folks do. So I'm going to do it. And then you're a semester in taking courses that may not align directly with degree achievement and where are you? Have you received that academic advising that is going to help you succeed? If you haven't, you're on your own, just randomly picking, and that's really that. That's where our work um, is is trying to be preventative and start these conversations about how do we create these conversations, these support, these paths, so people can maximize their time, maximize their benefits. Yeah, absolutely. As we see, you know, 200,000 approximately um, service members transition from the military every year. We know that 115,000 of them choose higher education. Are they coming to higher education thoughtfully or as you rightly point out, um, 
is it that we, you know, it, it's a, it seems to be the path of lesser resistance than to move into the employment sector um, directly. And so how can we assist um, transitioning service members in becoming more educated consumers of their future? Um, and to that end, though, we know that when they make that transition, and we do have the 115,000 that transition into higher education, what in your research and experience, Ainsley, um, do you find are some of the largest challenges and barriers, and what, what are you finding as to why they're making that higher education choice? Absolutely. So um, it's, it's all about culture shift. Um, I don't know about all of you, but any time I change an organization, especially inside higher ed, I mean, this is my career. I spent my entire career in higher education, but when I switch an organization, it takes me at least a year to truly understand the, the norm of the organization, to understand the language. Like, don't get me going on acronyms in higher ed, but from institution to institution, it's totally different. And this is, I got this, I understand this. Um, the cultural norms, just how, how things work, the organizational hierarchy. So from people that are all of a sudden going through really two cultural shifts concurrently, that's a lot. Um, that's actually amazing to be able to do that. Now, the help with transitioning from um, the military culture into civilian, there's at least touch points. You know, you can look back no matter how many years it's been. Okay, so you have this transition, but it's heightened because you're at a different point in your life. And then now you're talking about entering an entire new culture. So no wonder it is challenging. No wonder when you look at any transition model, the first part of any of those models is going to be almost vertical because the learning curve, there is no curve. It's just this learning X to Y. Um, so I think that we talk a lot about um, transition courses. I think there is nothing more important. I think that every institution that has a first year experience must have embedded in their curriculum a transition course. And I don't care if you have one service member enrolling that year, that course is offered. It's not canceled. Um, I think that we had a lot of discussions yesterday that were very powerful about individuals serving multiple roles, and maybe they're not the, the right individual to be uh, supporting our service member that are transitioning out. They may be a career counselor, they may be an academic advisor, it's awesome when that happens, but it's really looking at um, the, the staffing support, and it's easy for me to sit up here and talk about this. I've worked for five plus years at a community college that was had no funding and they were just scrambling to get all of the services that were needed. So I understand the paradigm between not having enough money, not having enough staff, and people's hearts really being in the right, right um, place. But when David and I first met, he asked me, um, you're a civilian, how did you get into this? Like, why are you so passionate about serving um, these students? And I told him the story that when I, I was a grant manager, a state manager uh, for a grant, and they housed me at Manchester Community College in Connecticut. And the only office space they had was I was a cube in a cubicle in their admissions office. And so I got to hear all of the advising that was happening. And there were two, uh, service members that had come through on one day. And this was before uh, the uh, understanding of more legislature around uh, the joint transcript and all of that. And I listened and I knew because I had a, uh, a history with admissions that these, the information that were given to these men was incorrect. And it was going to set them back their, their benefits were going to be just sucked dry. And it wasn't malicious at all. No one knew what they were looking at. And that was when the spark started. And I just saw that there, we needed to have a conversation. We needed to get more training for individuals, both onboarding and then all the way through the academic journey to make sure that we were not taking advantage of um, this precious time and funding that these individuals had. I took us a little far afield. David, would you like to add anything? Sorry. Yeah. 
been less very successful. Sorry, here we go. <laughs> Higher education has been very successful in talking about how we need degrees. And, but along the way, and I would say maybe in the past 20 years, higher education has also become out of touch with society because anywhere from 65 to 70% of employment positions in the country do not require a college degree, four-year degree we're really talking about. And so this, this incredible push has been so successful that even military members who spend several years in the military who college was not an option for them straight out of high school, they know that a goal, if not the goal, is to go to college so that I can move myself up the socioeconomic ladder. That has a, a dual effect. Those who probably couldn't go to college for whatever reason may now have the, the, the education benefits to be able to go, but what it does is it, it sort of drags some people, as you noted, into college who perhaps shouldn't be there. Um, and, and there's no perfect way to get all the people who should be in college into college and, and you know, sort of keep the ones out. That's not the way our society works. But um, it's, it's messy sometimes, and it's okay that some people depart college. Um, and then I think there's a, another segment, a, as you mentioned, uh, Ainsley, um, I think, was the first one many years ago to properly use Schlossberg's transition model. There's, the model can be used three ways. One is the transition out of the military. The other is the transition out of college. And then the third is the transition through college. It, that's, really, that's the key transition, and that's how Dr. Diamond did this correctly. So you're leaving the military. You begin a transition which lasts for the length of your college experience, and then you get a job. That's the full transition because college for most people is not the end state. And, um, but there are some people who are avoiding the responsibility of joining the workforce right away, and there's some financial benefits that can take place in college with the housing and whatever. And to be fair, for most people, you college can be easier and less uh, uh, onerous than working a job. And so some of those people are there, and again, eventually they'll weed themselves out, but in the meantime, they're taking up space. So I think those are the reasons why we see veterans and, and these people. Absolutely, you know, yesterday when um, Julian from the Department of Labor was speaking with us, he talked about um, an intentional warm handoff between uh, service members when they transition into the employment and workforce. And I, I often wondered, um, what does that warm handoff look like? How can we then encourage our transitioning members to begin with the end in mind? And I think uh, oftentimes that end for them is their date of separation. And that's not the end, that's the beginning. For those that choose higher education, the degree date or the credential date is the, the end. That's not the end either. That's the beginning <laughs> uh, as well. And so beginning with the end in mind, um, but, but really uh, at the very beginning of the beginning, that warm handoff to higher education um, out of the service, I think could be key and could be something we could look at um, in our, our space moving forward. But um, to both of your points exactly. If we pivot just a little bit, we have folks, again, from all sectors in the room. Higher education doesn't just happen. Um, we work across sectors with government entities, certainly philanthropic organizations, uh, workforce and economic development, uh, and also certainly higher education. What does collaborating across sectors look like? How do we create those sustainable career and education pathways by collaborating? What do those partnerships look like? And what does it look like when those partnerships are bad? So let's start with the good ones. <laughs> Any examples of how they're bad? Um, sure. I mean, I, I think that the, the good ones, again, we talk about being veteran ready, right? So the, the good ones are going to understand that you're getting another aspect of diversity joining your organization, whether it's higher education or whether it's a business. And um, you have to have some degree of cultural competency. Uh, we were talking about, there was a, a woman who came up and made a comment yesterday, I don't see her here today, but talking about, yeah, some of us have deployed, but A, you know, and it won't be, won't be very long till this becomes true, most separating veterans will not have deployed <laughs> soon. And even for those that have deployed, most who have deployed did not really see combat right, they stayed inside the wire or they went to some country where there wasn't shooting. And so deployment means different things. And so let's not presume that all of our 
veterans are combat veterans or broken or have PTSD and all those kinds of things. There's some cultural competency that has to go on there. And then I think too, what you're starting to see, especially in corporate America, and it's a little different in higher education, but you're starting to see affinity groups in corporate America, which is smart. It can get out of control, I think, um, but just so that there, you know, you can know where other veterans are in your organization. So an affinity, and, and this is a growing thing in most of corporate America, all kinds of affinity groups. And so I think that is a really good way to sort of provide a way for veterans to be able to connect and over. But again, just like I was talking about earlier, for the most part, my veteran status is not germane in this corporate job. And so let's not focus on that. Let's focus on my ability to do the job. Do I need to improve some stuff? Do it, what do I bring to the table? How can I help achieve the mission for the organization? And so those are the kinds of things that need to be focused on. So hopefully that gets a little bit at your question. So I spend a lot of time uh, working with educational policy and what I have found doing this work for the past 12 years is it's not enough to have the right people in the room. Um, I've been surrounded and, and really been excited about initiatives and been in a room and n just seen it devolve because of every individual's focus on their own endpoint. And I think the, the single most important thing is starting conversations, again, with the end point in mind. What is our objective here and how are we going to collaborate? Each one of us in this room is doing incredible work and our heart is all in the right place. We are here together today because we want to support our service members, right? In our own lens, though, that, that can be, become too focused. And I think that the, the challenges and what can make partnerships fail is when you don't go in with the outcome in mind and a strategic plan. Um, and strategic plans are wonderful. I mean, it's, it's a dirty word. I am the, the person on my campus and in these communities where I'm like, okay, let's go. What is our strategic plan? And they're like, oh God, it's Diamond again. And she wants a plan. I want a plan. I want to know that my time is so valuable I can be doing a lot of other things, and I don't care what level we are at. If you want me making phone calls or if you want me writing ed policy, I'm your person, but I need to know how we are collectively working together toward a shared goal, and that's when it falls apart, when people get too stymied in their own lane or they are answering to other people who have a different vision in mind that is not shared with the group. Absolutely. Yeah, we need to have a plan. And quite to Dr. McPhee's presentation yesterday, what are we going to do? How are we going to measure it? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and starting from some of those basic points um, really helps to lay that foundation and that framework when we have these collaborations. On a very practical level, when I work with colleges and universities, you know, um, the veteran service ecosphere uh, and, and quite the sea of goodwill is, is out there and has been um, certainly uh, post 9 11. And when we talk to our, uh, our very under resourced institutions, um, leveraging the 45,000 plus veteran service organizations that are out there, not just to serve student veterans, but to serve veterans. So when you have a, a student veteran who has housing insecurity, perhaps food insecurity, um, mental health needs, any kind of needs, there's a veteran service organization that if you collaborate with them in your community or in your region, you can leverage them and take the weight off of your campus resources or when there is a wait too long in your career services office or again uh, mental health and counseling services leverage the 45,000 plus VSOs out there because if we don't they're going to go away um, and we know that we don't have 45,000 plus veteran problems um, so really collaborating and leveraging those in a very practical way can help a lot of institutions that are are um, small to mid-sized and, and uh, quite under resourced so very well taken thank you so much um, to turn the conversation a little bit to, to your specialities, um, what research right now and innovations are you following in this space? 
So there's a couple of things to consider also. We're in this really strange um, time as far as research because of the pandemic. I, I work, I teach um, at Johnson Wales University and I tell my graduate students, be very careful right now, um, not my doctoral candidates, but my doctoral students, because it's much like the car industry. Like there's, there's nothing out there. I really hope none of you have to buy a car right now because you're, you're in for something. But what's happening is studies from like 2020 now are popping up and we're going to see more coming. So we're in this really kind of strange space with the research right now. Um, but I want to flip that question just a little bit to say that um, I spend a lot of my time watching educational policy and that too has been stymied because a lot of, um, a lot of things just kind of ground to a halt. So Education Commission of the States is um, <clears throat> almost a clearinghouse. It's a great organization. It's literally ECS.org. And you, you can go into their website, and what they do is they follow state statutes. There's 50 states. It's really hard for me to do my job and follow everything. So they put it all together in this awesome database. Click, boom, I can find out what's going on. So if you just go on there and search different keywords, you can find things. And so I always go in there, and I will put service member, military, veterans, and see what's going on. They do 50 state comparisons as well, and that's huge. And so right now they have, um, they published it in 2020, the update for it, but it's the 50 states comparison of academic credit for military experience. It's a report. And what I think is really wonderful about that is um, I was involved in, in the state of Connecticut um, releasing certification and licensure based on military experience. and. While all of these statutes and everything is great, it is really important to go back, just like it is with the research, and see what people are doing now, right? The research is wonderful, but what are those recommendations that people make at the end point of their dissertation or at the end point of that research? So how are they moving it forward? Who has grabbed onto this research and really brought it to light? I do need to make a shout out to Tyrell because that anyone who is engaged in research, um, hope, I hope that you saw my moment yesterday when he talked about the research that I did and how he brought that to the next level. That is the dream of a researcher. When I was engaging it in my work, I knew I was one person and I was one person in one little state in one little community college in one state. And now to hear the work that has moved forward, that's the dream. That is absolutely the dream. The dream is sitting here and talking to all of you and having wonderful conversations on the sidebar about the work that you're doing and how we collectively move it forward. So again, there, there's some wonderful research that is out right now. Um, and I think the next six months is going to be really powerful to see what else is, is coming. I think one of the interesting things is uh, the program that I come from is a, is a very rigorous qualitative program. Um, and while I respect the quantitative stuff, we're, there are only certain moments I think that are appropriate for quali quantitative studies of, of veterans at the moment because we still are in a place where we don't know what we don't know, which is the call for qualitative research. Um, 12, 13 years ago, we started off on the wrong foot. There was a bunch of howling at the moon and there was a bunch of flag and banner waving um, that got us twisted sideways in the wind and it, and it caused some questions, which is how I got involved in all of this. Um, I, I see folks like Tristan out there who we had dinner w with last night and that's what I think the potential of student veterans is. And you can meet Tristan later. Um, and um, and the, the dialogue 12, 13 years ago was veterans are broken, veterans are struggling, they can't transition from the military, they can't succeed in college, which to me was nonsense. And one, one of my uh, mentors at UMass said, um, well, why don't you research veterans? I said, well, what's the issue with veterans? And they said, well, that's what you have to go figure out. So I immediately went to go look into that and nothing that I was reading in the literature matched my eyeball test. You serve for 20 years in the military and you see the great potential of what is the greatest slice, I think, of America there is, and that is veterans. None of them are prior criminals. None of them have prior drug use. They entered a highly disciplined organization. They trained to a high level in austere environments and deployed all over the world. 
you can't say that about most people. There is no reason that population should be struggling at large in higher education. And as it turns out, um, SVA brought us the study about four years ago that definitively talks about, depending on how you slice the numbers and how many years you talk about success rates, between 70 and 78 percent of our student veterans are succeeding, which I challenge any other demographic to be at that level. Um, but what we started at was we started on the wrong foot. And so what I tried to do and what Ainsley has done as well is we need to set a better foundation. So, and so we did that through our models and our conceptualizing and our challenging these early plots of, of, of veterans failing. And yes, there are some veterans who are failing, but it's not, the population is not failing and we need to change that. And we're still fighting that message now, which frustrates me, but can only do so much. And so you know, I come here and I talk about that kind of stuff, but we, we set a foundation and those who are following in the path of that foundation are doing good things to share. The first thing you have to do in qualitative research, you have to describe the basic phenomenon. And so the basic phenomenon is what are the experiences of veterans in college, right? We've had a few of those studies and so, um, and we've done a bunch of that. My study was that, Dr. Diamond's study was that. And the next logical step from that is now we need to get into aspects of diversity because of the imbalance of diversity within particularly the veteran community, it's highly men and it's highly white, which is fine, but that means there's a need for exploring the experiences of women. There's a need for exploring the experiences of those um, ethnic and racial diversity folks. And then of course on the disability spectrum. Um, and so we are now starting to see those kinds of studies starting to come out. The great thing about being a dissertation chair, which is all I do now, um, I have of my 24 students, I usually have between uh, 10 to 12 who are studying something to do related with the military. And so my own students have had women doctoral student veterans, black women student veterans, black women graduate veterans, black men in STEM that are not veterans, but those kinds of aspects of diversity, we're getting into a lot of these kinds of uh, aspects of diversity. One complaint about the research over the years has been almost all the research on student veterans has been dissertations. Welcome to my reality. I don't know that that's gonna change um, because the, 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 the glut of doctors that we're producing, the goal for doctors is you have to go publish. So all of the peer reviewed journals, their acceptance rate for journal articles is going down and down and down, which means it's hard to get the word out about this stuff. The good news is we have ProQuest and all these other kind of things. You can much more easily search dissertations than you could 20 years ago. So, oh well, that's where the knowledge is, deal with it. And uh, come to conferences and join professional networks and, um, and every once in a while, and um, I see Monica out there, there are, um, trade journals, if you will, that are trying to bridge this gap in getting knowledge out there. And um, higheredjobs.com, which also has the higheredmilitary.com, are inviting people with knowledge to share it in you know, concise chunks, which is a super way to do things. I get far more uh, comment and engagement out of the couple of things that I've published there than I do out of most of any of the other stuff that I do. And so let's not box ourselves into the paradigm. Let's continue to come to conferences and share what we know. And let's get away from this woe is me, veterans are struggling thing. We, we need to figure out how we can describe success so we can replicate that. And then we also need to figure out the slice of veterans that are struggling who with help can succeed. And then let's not worry about the rest. Yeah, absolutely. Being veterans traversing higher education for so many years as, as doctoral candidates and then as professionals. Um, I think the deficit framing that we've seen really tells folks like us, well, you can't trust your lying eyes. <laughs> you need to simply know better. And so having um, the conversation, and that's why conversations like this, I think, are so important, because we're, we're flipping that on its head. And it turns the conversation from deficit framing to how can we leverage the strengths, soft skills, hard skills, um, that our transitioning members bring to the academic community. How can we leverage those to propel them onto their intended career path and through higher education as a lifelong learner, traversing the lifelong learning and credential cycle, doesn't end with us, 
um, but certainly not from a place of deficit rating, but of a place of leverage and strength. So very, very important. Before we open it up for uh, some questions from the audience, I have that one last panel question that everybody hates and I'm gonna ask it anyway. If you could wave a magic wand and change one thing in this space, what would it be? Go ahead, Magento. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, when we got this question, I was like, oh, okay. You can um, say people that drive slowly in the left lane. Yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I, I think, um, and this may be controversial to say, is uh, I think we're on the cusp of a societal change. These conversations about earning a living wage um, really will drive what's happening in higher education. Um, it's a much broader, much deeper, much longer conversation. But if I had one magic wand, it, it really would be to – to start these conversations about why. Why is higher education right for the service member, for the individual? Why do you want to do this? Is this a dream? Did you go in? Did you enlist with this in mind? Because that's fantastic. Let's go. Let's do this. Um, I come, I was talking, again, Tristan, you're getting a lot of airtime today. I was talking to Tristan last night, and I said that I'm very fortunate that um, I come from a family that has four children that went in all different directions. My oldest brother is a Black Hawk helicopter pilot with a 160th. I have another brother that decided to become a boat builder. Another one joined the Peace Corps. Yeah, imagine what holiday conversations are like at my house. Um, and I went the whole way uh, with academia. So I think that that perspective just allows me to say there are multiple paths. And in the United States, that's a real hard hard question to answer, or a hard conversation to get involved in because so many people are like, yep, I, I don't know and I don't care what I'm studying. I'm just going to go get a degree because I have to to make a living wage. And so I think we are right at the beginning of this this conversation about we've been waiting for the higher ed bubble to burst for a while, so where do we go and when does it happen? I, I think to, to kind of go back to the research and the focus in higher education, um, and, and I'm going to ruffle some feathers here because that's what I do best. Um, we have focused for a long time, uh, in fact, the name of this conference, on the transition out of the military and into college. Um, not that we shouldn't do that, Right, that there there are important bridges that need to be gapped because we know we have we have seen that TAP or GPS or whatever it's called these days they do well on the pushing you towards self employment or immediate job employment, uh, but but the TAP organization acknowledges that they struggle with preparedness for higher education. There there is no good bridge between the military and higher education, so we do need to focus there, but the majority of our energy needs to be focused far more holistically than that. And when you go back to the SBA study, and of course the SBA study didn't take students up until 2017, the data closed much older than that. And so the experiences of those successful students that are um, spotlighted in the data in the SBA study were not supported in college. They did not have special programs. Some of them were not even on the post 9-11 GI Bill, they were Montgomery GI, people, uh, GI Bill people. And for those of you who are familiar with that, that's not really good financial assistance. And so the veterans that have been achieving a 70 to 78% success rate have done so while overcoming obstacles, all of the obstacles that we talked about. So do I think veterans really have a big problem transitioning to higher education? Nope. Is it bumpy and, and unclean? Absolutely. But the veterans that I worked with over 20 years, they can overcome things far more challenging than moving into higher education. However, the piece that we can focus on, that we should be focusing on, is what is going on. Non-traditional student experiences are all about the academic experience. We have not been focusing our research on the academic experience. What is college? College is not student affairs. I, I professionalized to higher education in the student affairs field. College is distinctly not a student affairs environment. It is an academic environment. We earn degrees, right? And so we need to focus on the academic experience of student veterans because if veterans are gonna go out and be heroes, the fake news about all veterans are heroes, right? If we're gonna go save the world because we're veterans and we're the greatest, we need to get great education and that educational experience needs to be good. And so back to what I said about research earlier, what are the academic experiences of student veterans in college today? 
We need to know that, we need to unpack that. And guess who's gonna learn out of that? The faculty are gonna learn because the people with whom our student veterans are interacting the most on our college campuses are peer students and faculty, not student affairs, not even really other veterans. We have got to focus on that academic experience. So if I could wave my, my wand, that would be the thing that I wanna see focused on is that. You wave the wand and keep the main thing the main thing, right? Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much to both of you for a fantastic conversation today. And we'll go ahead and open it up for um, some follow-up questions from the audience. If you don't mind using the mic so um, folks that are participating virtually are able to hear, thank you. How you doing? Uh, Pat Scalen, uh, Booth Grad 95 veteran, and I'm uh, with the board with MAG. Uh, great data regarding the veteran success of going to higher education. What is the reason that that is happening? When I got out and went, decided to come to Booth, I had no idea about where to go and where to choose. It was only because I took another job and networked and did the things that we all do to find that next step. My concern or my interest would be how do we address vets while they're in that last phase of their career so that they can have that information to make those choices. I was just talking with Terrell about this last night. Um, I, I think uh, TAP has thrown up their hands. Um, and I think that um, a leader organization probably needs to step forward. I mean, one of the things broadly in higher education, well beyond student veterans, is getting the right college match. Our, our kids are approaching college age or in college. And um, it's a universal problem. Everybody thinks they need to go to U Chicago or Harvard. Well, UNC Charlotte is good if you want to be a school teacher. Nothing wrong with that. UMass, you know, UConn, whatever. Um, everybody can't go to Harvard. There's not enough capacity. And, and so we need to find the right match. And perhaps the way to do that is to just create some awareness, create some programming, videos, YouTube videos, whatever it is, information that bypasses what is an, an agreeably failed process and getting better information. There are some websites that are better than, than uh, what your experience were, but websites are onerous and there's only about 6,700 colleges or maybe there's only about 6,500 now in, in, in the country. Um, let's not create a giant spreadsheet with what all that means because there's a lot of fake news uh, on what we offer in there too. But let's, let's create some, how, how do you go, uh, um, our, we, we're featured in a book that I edited that's on the back table if anybody wants to get one. But one of the things that we talk about in one of the chapters in there is how do you figure this out? This is something that's not being taught and I think that that's something that can be done and I think it's gonna require somebody doing it in spite of our beloved DOD and VA and those people because it's, it's just not happened well there. And most important, um, it, it's the service member's voice. I mean, obviously you networked, right? Tristan was talking about this last night. You talk to people who have a shared experience with you and went somewhere where they felt successful, well, they succeeded, but they felt a part of the community, all, all of that. It's, it's gotta come directly from the veteran voice. And I'm not saying this is easy. Like, how do you go around and, that's a really cool study, though, to think about how to get the collective voice and people's experiences and then broadcast that. Because let's face it, you know, admissions offices are very powerful and they're very well funded. And it comes back to the very first question about does an institution want to be seen as veteran friendly? So how do we kind of, again, shift that lens back to the institution to say, you need to capture these very powerful student voices and you need to market the hell out of it to the population that you're seeking to bring in because of all of these non-deficit reasons that you want these people in your institution. And once they matriculate, I think too, there's a responsibility on the part of higher education to really, we know that our, our student veterans are the maybe more non-traditional of non-traditional students. And so making sure that if you have an upfront, proactive, intrusive advising model, to begin with, uh, making sure that if the, the student veteran, obviously they're sitting in your office, so they believe that your institution is their best fit institution, but making sure that their academic format is a best fit for them and really setting them on that path, uh, the path is a whole lot easier. And we see a lot greater retention rates um, and persistence and degree completion when we have that upfront advising with our student veterans. So helping them once, immediately when they get to the institution, 
uh, helps as well, when there's not that thoughtful path like you both had. Next, anything else? Sure. Thank, I, thanks. A great discussion. Um, uh, this this whole issue about um, uh, veterans kind of understanding or transitioning service members understanding what they want to get out of college and being more informed. I think that's pretty important. But there's two other players. We've talked about the veterans and we've in transitioning service members, and we've talked about academia. I think there are kind of two other players in this that are pretty important. One is I think one is DoD. Uh, writ large. I think I shared this yesterday when I was talking to someone, but when I was on active duty, I was one of those folks that just said, go to college, go to college, go to college. It wasn't, you know, what you're going to study. It wasn't a discussion about what the goal was. It was more about check the block, just go to college because it was about getting promoted, whether you're an NCO or whether you're an officer, it's about getting promoted. And I think that's, I think we should be more sophisticated, uh, speaking uh, DOD, we should be more sophisticated when we're talking to service members um, about what they want to do and, and helping them be more informed about what, as, as opposed to just say, go to college, go to college. The other, uh, uh, I think the other player are employers. Um, I get so frustrated, uh, and I think, David, you brought up the point that you know, there's a lot of people who go to college that do, do they really need to go to college. And I get so frustrated when I look at it, when I go on LinkedIn or go on Indeed and you look at the job postings, and they all say, like every single job in the world, if you, ju if you just spend a few hours on those websites, it looks like every single job in the world requires a four-year college degree. And I just wish our, you know, and, and I don't have a solution to this. I'm not quite sure how you incentivize employers or HR departments to be more specific about what is needed to be successful in that particular job or that particular career. Um, I, don't, I, I don't have a solution. I, I just, I'm more frustration than anything else. But uh, I, so I, I, maybe this is more of a comment than a question, but yeah, just getting these other folks uh, involved, whether it's employers, DOD, academia, and, and of course the veteran or the service member, be more informed about uh, what they want to do and as they kind of plot out uh, if they're going into higher education. So that, That's a great point, Sam. Bec and, and I don't know what the answer or the solution to this is because um, if you dig into the research a little bit, um, pretty much across the board, broad brushing, employers, writ large, I don't use that term very much, but in this case, employers, um, are not satisfied that colleges are delivering graduates with the requisite skills, critical thinking, writing ability, presentation ability. Now, if colleges across the board, you know, there are exceptions. I, I think perhaps University of Chicago might be delivering uh, and, and not part of the problem, but if colleges are not delivering that, it really makes me scratch my head why every job description on LinkedIn says there's a bachelor's degree, re degree required. Why are you seeking exactly what you're complaining about that's not delivering the mail, right? You bring someone in on an internship and train them up and, um, and give them the skills that they need and never mind the college piece. Send them to college later. There are... I can only speak to my my state that there are some pretty interesting um, collaborations happening um, in Connecticut between uh, Harvard happens to be the the center of um, insurance, right? So there's a group um, that gets together quarterly uh, to talk about how to get more service members into the insurance business and how they do that is it started off as a just a very casual conversation about people literally emailing each other um, resumes of s separated military members and it has grown to be a, um, a fairly large group inside the state of Connecticut. So, but again, it's, we were talking earlier this morning, there are so many people reinventing the wheel in, in this space. And I think that those, um, those groups of employers that get together that understand this, someone obviously talked to someone about the amazing credentials and skills, soft and hard, that this population has. And these are the people that you want in your businesses. Um, so I've seen that happen, but that's just one that's one drop in the bucket, right? One example of how I've seen it starting to percolate. Um, but how do you scope and scale? That's always the question. But thank you for the comment. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate the discussion. Um, <coughs> the 
it's been a while, but maybe in the early 2000s, I would teach adult development, including emerging adulthood, to you know students not of universities like Chicago. And if I remember right back then, pre-online college, the data was like the average student did seven years, started and stopped college, didn't always get the degree they started in, worked in between. Um, <coughs> anything like that kind of data for veterans. I mean, I, I'm assuming the GI Bill pushes them towards a kind of completion, but I don't see any reason why. Yeah, there, there's, uh, so what SBA was able to do, for those that are not familiar with this, the studies, you can go to the SBA website and you can look up, there's two studies that they've done. And um, uh, SBA, due to their uh, uh, proximity and access, um, which is amazing, are, are the only organization that has both been able to access data from the VA, which interestingly does not track degree completion, it tracks benefit usage, which is a whole other conversation. But those that are enrolled, veterans that are enrolled in, in higher education, and the NCES data, which actually captures completion by social security number. You can imagine that we can't just give access to this data to anybody, because it will run amok. Um, but SBA got access to that. And so what they were able to do, most um, performance metrics for colleges are in the four to six year graduation uh, rate. What SBA was able to do was to consider stopouts for veterans who had deployment or breaks such as that and expand it out to eight years. And that's why um, I talk about the eight year mark. And if you dig deep enough into the data, I think you can see it's a 77.8% graduation rate for uh, veterans when you consider an extra two years. Now, of course, like any group of non-traditional students, if you give it an extra 20 years, you're gonna get more people. But um, statistically speaking throughout society, when you expand it out that far, it doesn't move the needle data-wise, but it does for veterans. And so, uh, so I think it's really important to, to talk about that. And sometimes you have to capture that additional data because unlike certain populations who may just stop out for whatever reason, if I have to deploy to the Middle East uh, for a mission, I, I can't continue my degree right now, especially if I'm a guard or reservist. It's like, yeah, you're gonna pick up and you're gonna be gone for four to six months. Well, that can knock me out of two semesters consecutively of school. And um, you know th those people's minds are still in getting that degree. And so uh, I, I don't know the perfect way to calculate for that, but SBA certainly captured a piece of that in their study. The study's amazing. If you like data and like getting really deep, then you go by institutional type and uh, just dig and dig and dig and see how those completion ra rates vary by institutional type. Um, and the, the other data point that is really important that goes ac across the board for, um, for student persistence and matriculation is uh, there was a study that came out three years ago about if a service member connects with one individual on a college campus, and it doesn't matter who the individual is, their retention and matric matriculation rate goes through the roof. It, it hits like in the 90s. Um, and that says a lot about connection and support. And um, so I think that there's, the data are really, really important to pushing the narrative forward as to how we support and how we really get funding, get this on administrators' radars of what is truly needed for the individuals to succeed. That was the piece that came out of my dissertation study was the success influencer. And you had staff members, family members, or faculty members who were the person that validated a student veteran that their decision to go to college was the right one, and then you couldn't hold them back. You could put earthquakes and landslides in front of them and they would still complete their degree. It really speaks to that difference in the decision. Uh, most non-traditional learners are perhaps pursuing post-secondary education or graduate education to move up in their organization or out of their organization. Um, and so the reason for traversing into post-secondary education for student veterans is wholly different. And it really messes with our data <laughs> and gives us all kinds of confounding variables we love to work with, but to your point. Thank you. Hi, Teresa. Hi. Um, so my question is kind of going to touch on that because um, I really appreciate the conversation it is having. Um, and I really appreciated that idea that you have to reframe what success is, um, especially for veterans. Um, 
because you pointed to all of those things that sometimes they have to take time off. So their, their pathway through higher ed is not always a straight path. Um, and then also their reasoning for going to college not always is to get um, a higher paying job or those opportunities. And so thinking that part of that success might be you're talking about the end game. That's a very important conversation that what do they want to get out of school? Is it just that purpose? Is it just um, the learning of new skills um, so that they can take it into their life and find a new normal? So it may not always be um, occupation and employment. Although I can speak from experience, veterans that are motivated are fantastic in that department and they should be recruited very highly because of all of the strengths that they do have. Um, and then we can kind of reframe that idea of the broken soldier, that narrative that has been um, persisting, especially since these wars have happened, that they are no longer, they're not broken, they're just lost, a lot of them, and reframing that idea of success to be something more than just get into a good paying job. Um, because I will say, too, the motivation for joining the military changed a lot on 9-11. Um, pr previously to that, a lot of people that did join were joining because of the education benefits. There's a whole swath of people that did that, and that changed dramatically for what the motivation for joining the military was because they wanted to go serve their country in a very tumultuous time. So trying to find a way to capture them is going to be really difficult, and I was just thinking what your thoughts on that are and that idea of reframing success. It's, it's a great point, and I thought about this yesterday, but then we ran out of time in Teresa's session, so I didn't say anything. Um, but I think there's three, the, for the most part, the, the majority are on a pathway to a degree for um, uh, some sort of uh, job. Um, and But then there are some, particularly some of our very much older uh, veterans are just getting that degree because they want to get that degree. And then there are some in the disability sector that that would be for too. There's another interesting population that speaks to what success is. Um, I disagree that earning the degree is the only measure of success. Um, there's, there's, a, there's an extremely short amount of uh, talent in the cybersecurity field and in stuff like biotech. And I can tell you those companies are paying really well for people that have taken a semester's worth of courses in that stuff. And if the whole point of all these GI Bill programs and transition assistance programs is to make sure we can get people from the military to be productive members of society, and you can do that without getting a college degree, so what? Good on you, right? So again, what success is. Um, and I would say the other thing, if I could wave, if I could wave a second magic wand, um, getting all veterans to go talk to disability services on campus, even if they think they don't need it, um, that's probably the other second most important thing, maybe even more important than studying your academic experiences, because most don't know that there's all kinds of experiences. And we talked about it yesterday. We don't want to be the weak link, and we don't want to go ask for help, which is absolutely broken advising that we do in the military. The single worst thing the military does is try to teach people that they don't need help. It's stupid. The thing that I, I love what you were saying, um, at the community college that I work at in Connecticut, I spent three years hanging out in the vet center. And I can't tell you how many folks, yes, they were there taking classes and at the end point was an associate's degree. They were there for the community. They were there to be able to have coffee and speak with other people who spoke their language. Um, and again, I will forever be thankful for them letting some random woman come in there every day and hang out and try and learn the language and listen to the stories and talk to them about their journey. Um, and so many of them, they were really okay with where they were. Yeah, maybe they would take one or two classes a semester, but that wasn't it for them. Their success was showing up every day. And that needed to be acknowledged and is definitely something that has been in the forefront. Like, yes, I am very outcomes or oriented. Anyone who knows me understands that. Um, but it, it was a really good lesson for me to be like this, the word success has many different definitions and it's all back to that lens of the person that is talking and what, what their um, 
definition of success is. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of to Sam's point earlier, as we see um, corporates um, and, and other folks in the space that are really focused on credentialing and what that definition of success for badging, micro-credentialing, and really identifying what skills have you mastered in the service and how do those skills translate, not simply that you need a four-year degree because you need a four-year degree, because we, we, need you, we need to know that you can persist. This is what we need, we need you to know and this is how that translates and then teaching the service member to Ainsley's point while you're still in the service that you are experiencing success and then that's how that success transfers into the civilian sector is a great place to start. Your point's very well taken, Teresa, thank you. I think we have time for one more. Thank you all so much. So I think um, speaking to higher ed specifically, we've seen like every institution has its own structure and its own, you know, veteran services center. So maybe it's more of like a shout out of over the years, if you've seen institutions that are really doing well, um, because I think after speaking with a lot of people, like there's one veteran resource coordinator and that university is veteran ready but that person is so stressed, they're expected to be an SEO, they're expected to do the advising, they're expected to do programming. So I know that there's so many different structures of how we can you know, achieve this aspirational goal, but what is a structure that you have seen that is actually really awesome? Is it someone in, in finance, there's one specific for person in financial aid, there's one specific person in you know, all the different sectors, but I just would love to hear that because I think Right now, a lot of people are struggling with, well, my veteran center is in diversity, equity, and inclusion. I want to be in student affairs. And then another veteran's uh, coordinator is like, I want to be uh, in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I'm in student affairs. So if you've seen any really good structures that you feel lead to this ultimate goal, thanks. The answer is no, um, and it depends. So if- It's if why we're still doing this work. It's why we're still doing this work. I mean, if you're Texas A&M, and you have 3,000 student veterans, um, and you have you know 40 or 50 people that work in your organization, you're probably gonna get it done for all your, your veterans. Um, if you're University of Chicago and you have you know 200 veterans, and you have three staff members, and then three other people who do things part-time, that may be what you're, so it's more about what does your population need rather than, and I can always say, I always think of the, the perfect person to run one of these places is Janine Wirt, Dr. Janine Wirt up at UMass Lowell, uh, former VA social worker and um, has worked in veteran services um, for many years. And, but that's exactly the person you're describing. She does not sleep. She's six years behind on sleep because not only she earned her doctorate along the way, but she's certifying and she's working with students who have real serious problems, homeless students that she has, um, veterans with serious VA problems and all kinds of stuff like that. So I, I don't, I haven't seen something that's perfect, but I, I think that what institutions need to do if they truly want to be veteran ready is they need to make a true assessment and they need, if they really want to do it, if they don't want to do it, then don't do it. Because the worst thing you can do for a veteran is say, oh yeah, we're veteran friendly, and then you show up and there's nothing but crickets, right? So be honest about it. If you don't wanna serve veterans, don't serve veterans. They'll go somewhere else. They'll come to University of Chicago, it's fine. Um, but deliver to the extent that's reasonable and maybe even a little more than what you think is reasonable and divert some energy towards that. Um, and I would say, ideally, it's not part-time positions. I think it's full-time positions, dedicated positions. Yeah, um, I can't wait for the day where my dissertation is dusty on a shelf and no one wants to talk to me anymore because we figured this out. That's the dream, right? That, that is the dream. Um, the model that I have seen uh, that has worked at community colleges is when you have a former service member who is overseeing things. Like that's, that works, Th that works pretty well, but those offices tend to be one person burning the midnight oil, not sleeping because there's so many factors that go into every individual service member's journey that has to be accounted for. Um, there's not enough funding, there's not enough staff. Um, so no, the, again, the answer is no. There is not a model that I have seen because it is institution specific. Um, but 
yeah, just everything that David said as well. And I think it's funny that you bring up Texas A&M. I was talking with Colonel Smith um, not that long ago, and uh, something that he said that really resonated with me um, was that you really have to take a top-down approach. And whether your Veterans Resource Center and the staffing model falls under academic affairs, whether it falls under student affairs, um, we, we just think it shouldn't fall under disability services. Um, but whether it falls under one of those veins, you have to have administrative support for your programming. Uh, and so to have it be very tangential uh, and kind of an afterthought to David's point um, is not a best practice and not a recipe for success. You have to have that top-down uh, uh, funding, resources, and support um, to begin. But I don't think there's one best way to do it either. Y indeed, indeed. Well, thank you so much, everyone. You've been a wonderful audience. Let's show our panelists appreciation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy, Angeli, and David. I uh, wanted to give a, my token of appreciation to you all for, for participating in this discussion. It was phenomenal. Uh, here at the University of Chicago, of course, rigorous inquiry demands that we have different and competing perspectives. We want to ensure that we're not hearing one side of the story, but hearing the entire story. And I know that in the questions and in your comments, uh, things came up about veterans going directly into the workforce. Uh, so we ha um, we're honored, I'm going to say she's ducking out of here in a second, but we're honored to have my friend Liz Belcaster, who has been in this space of working with veterans for many, many, many years. Uh, she actually sat at the tables and discussions when SkillBridge program was created, when a lot of the initiatives for veterans were created for this country. So she'll be moderating the panel discussion after our next speaker uh, with a couple of people, Lindsay from the Honor Foundation, uh, Dr. Cody Nichols from University of Arizona, as well as Candy Tillman from 50 Strong. Uh, but right now, I'd like to bring Dr. McPhee back up. She has been working with our undergraduate student veter veteran, Eric, who's going to talk about his research. Don't worry, I'm not presenting again. Um, <laughs> I didn't know the stage was the option. I just offered Eric the opportunity to present his findings through, through interpretive dance but he declined. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to introduce Eric briefly. Uh, everything you know that I presented yesterday would definitely not have been possible without his uh, work, sharp insight, and just incredible spirit and contribution. So I appreciate that. So Eric Snyder is a second year in the college. He's a dual econ and religious studies major. He's the lead research associate on the team that both collected and analyzed all the findings from last year's symposium and uh, was also an incredible uh, collaborator this summer with a field research project. And he, I did say he was seven years in the Army, right? Army veteran um, medic while he served. And he's going to be presenting the findings on social capital, which was sort of one of the, the big ahas out of the data that we collected last year and which we're submitting for publication um, in a journal of higher education studies shortly. Good morning, everyone. Uh, hope everyone can hear me OK. So as Dr. McPhee said, my name is Eric Snyder. I'm going to be going over some of the specific findings from this ongoing research project that started last year. Uh, particularly the idea of social capital among enlisted veterans and officers uh, in the realm of higher education. It's going to be about you know 15 minute presentation. I know us having served for seven years in the army that uh, PowerPoints can be a little overwhelming. So clicker, uh, I think it's right here. Perfect. Sorry about that. Um, Anyways, so I'm going to try and get through this presentation pretty quickly. It'll be about 15 minutes. Start with a brief overview of some of the you know, topics that I'm going to be hitting on, followed by the three major findings, and then a brief recommendation. And then after that, we'll have about 15 minutes of Q&A. Uh, a little bit behind schedule, so you know, I'll try and go a little faster through this presentation part in order to get uh, more Q&A. So if anything comes up during the presentation, please just write it down or remember it, and we can talk about it after. So as I said, 
This all emerged from uh, last year's symposium and the research we've been doing on that. What kind of came out as we were going through the interviews that we conducted was, first of all, this idea of heterogeneity versus homogeneity. And what I mean by that is it was touched upon the panel, this idea that a lot of programs that are created to help veterans are specifically that. They're created to help veterans, period. That's it. The issue with that is that the veteran population is very, very diverse. Being a veteran is just kind of one, one identifier that defines who they are as an individual. They can also identify with racial, ethnic minorities, religious minorities, LGBTQ populations. So focusing a uh, one-size-fits-all approach to veterans is not helpful, and that became very apparent. What became even more apparent was that there is this idea of disparity in experiences amongst the enlisted and the officers, particularly in the idea of social capital. Without going too far into like a Webster's Dictionary uh, definition of social capital, it's pretty much this idea of it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's having this connection that can help you transition out of the military, through college, get a job. We found that this social capital accrued by officers versus that accrued by enlisted, there's a large gap. As far as how the research was conducted, again, it was myself, Dr. McPhee, Dr. Odom, and two other work study uh, students here at the university did semi-structured interviews with participants from last year's symposium, and then we did a qualitative analysis, uh, coded those, spent a lot of long nights looking at data, and from that, the following findings emerged. Findings. The first one was the idea of loss of social support system. So as was touched upon earlier in the panel, the military community is very, very unique in its sense of you know, bonding. We have up there bonding capital. It's one of this idea of uh, social capital. For bonding capital, it's part of a homogenous community. So the military is very, very homogenous while you're in service. You wear the same uniform. You, know, you have stacks and stacks of regulations that tell you how to conduct you know, personal affairs. No matter what career trajectory you take through the military, whether Navy, Marines, Air Force, Space Force, Army. You all have a shared experience of having gone through some form of basic training, being yelled at you know, by guys in round hats, forced to wake up at 3.30 to make your bed when you're you know, a grown man, grown woman, grown you know, however you identify. So no matter what, you can always fall back on this shared experience. I think they mentioned it in the earlier panel, there's a similar feeling amongst you know, the academic circles uh, having worked in hospitals, I think there's a similar uh, feeling amongst medical workers. But it becomes more intense for the military community just because of the shared trauma, not just necessarily from deployment, as been brought up, not everyone deploys and not all deployments are combat. But most people in the military, whether it's field exercises or just daily physical, emotional, uh, spiritual stressors, have this shared you know, sense of bonding, shared experience. So that's why I have the Band of Brothers thing up there. Once you leave military service, this is instantly taken away from you, instantly. It's very hard to find a community, once again, like that. So pretty much all of the, all of the uh, interviewees that had served in the military brought this up, is that when they left, they just felt isolated, they felt alone. What helped with that was this idea of bridging networks, bridging capital, whereas the bonding capital and bonding networks was a more homogenous, you know, social aspect. This is amongst different groups, so, you know, different cultures, different socioeconomic backgrounds. In this case, military versus non-military. What we found was that officers quite often had these bridging networks set up and had developed them over many years. And it makes sense considering officers have to go through some form of college, so they already have an alumni network. In the case of more prestigious, you know, West Point, Naval Academy style schools, they have very successful bridging networks. Even in the case of their professional peers, other officers that get out, have mentors from higher level officers, you know, colonels, generals. They usually have connections in the corporate world and it can help ease that transition from the military into either education or into the corporate world. 
listed don't necessarily have this, and they also don't necessarily have a concept of what this means. They have the bonding capital, the bonding networks, the social aspect. We kind of joked about it is that you can find other enlisted veterans and go to the bar and have a beer and complain about, you know, oh, I don't know how to apply to school, I don't know how to get my VA benefits. But neither does anyone else because they've maybe never gone to college. They've never had a job other than the military. So they can say, that, oh, yeah, that sucks, but not much I can do to help you with that. And what became an issue is that the enlisted veterans we talked to just didn't really know how to develop these networks. They knew it was necessary. They knew that they wanted to develop these networks, but it's more of a hopeful dream that in the future, maybe, we'll get around you know, to find these professional uh, connections that can help us transition through school, through the corporate world. So what helps? Regardless of these networks, you know, everyone struggles. Officer, enlisted, doesn't matter. What we found is helpful is giving veterans a platform, giving veteran students a platform to speak, to tell their stories, stories to connect with others. Um, so research has shown that having a dedicated veteran center on campus is highly beneficial. Not as a place where veterans can go to hide from the non-military affiliated community on campus, but a place where they can have a platform to share their stories. What emerged from many of the interviews is this idea of feeling alienated on campus, of not knowing the rules anymore. Everything's very rigidly defined how to act, how to speak to other people when you're in the military. Come to academic settings, those rules become a little blurry. The veterans transitioning into higher education aren't sure you know, how to speak, how to act, what's right, what's wrong. They also have the idea of imposter syndrome, the idea that they don't belong there, that all the other students are better, more prepared. So giving them a space to feel, one, supported, but two, wanted, to feel like what they have to offer is appreciated and desired has been very highly beneficial in helping these veteran students not only feel wanted on campus, but feel like they belong on campus. So just a brief summary in case you stopped listening to me while I was talking. The three big findings that we, we emerged and that we found the most interesting was one, the idea of losing this you know, social support system upon leaving the military, which not a huge surprise. What came as a surprise was how different subsections of the military community, specifically the officer versus enlisted population, kind of dealt with this transition, this loss of support. I don't know if you can ever fully recover that sense of camaraderie you know, that you had in the military, but officers overwhelmingly had other forms to fall back on or knew how to form new networks. Whereas the enlisted, it was just kind of a vague concept up in the cloud. The final thing was the idea of veteran support on campus having veteran centers, having symposiums like this, and just feel, making the veteran students feel appreciated and wanted on campus, and that's huge in helping them transition and create a new sense of community. So some of the recommendations, uh, first and foremost, is just the idea of outreach. You can't help student veterans if there are no student veterans. As was brought up, not every veteran needs to go to college. Not every veteran wants to go to college. But the ones that do, making sure that not only helping them get admitted, but helping them get admitted to the right school. As was brought up, not everyone needs to go to Harvard. Not everyone needs to go to U Chicago. Uh, SIU has a great aviation program. I don't think U Chicago has an aviation program. So if you want to be a pilot for Boeing, maybe don't come to U Chicago. So getting them the information, reaching out to these people, finding out what the end goal is, key. Goes on with the administrative support and engagement, having vet centers, having symposiums, having uh, Veterans Day, Veterans Week, you know, events on campus where veterans can engage with the non-military affiliated communities on campus and, you know, share stories and find out that really at the end, not all that difference. Might be 10 years age different, but still humans. They're still all here trying to get an education. And last is just future research. Uh, when we were going through 
kind of our own literature reviews and stuff and looking for data, found there's really not a whole lot out there on particularly this officer versus enlisted divide. Comes across as kind of intuitive to myself, um, might come across as intuitive to the rest of you as well. So maybe that might be a reason why there isn't a ton of formal research on it, but it, it is lacking. And then just, uh, it was brought up early in the earlier panel as well, the idea of research on different minority subgroups amongst the veterans, the female, a LGBTQ, uh, racial, ethnic minorities. So just getting more research and collecting more data on this uh, topic. So with that being said, I'll finish talking here. And uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to come up to the microphone. That's actually a really, really good set of findings, given a relatively small number of people that were interviewed. So, kudos to that. More of a more of a supporting carryit to the next level, having observed numerous um, veteran offices yesterday. Some people might have, have had their feathers ruffled when I said there's no evidence that says that the veterans office does anything to improve success. The office itself does not. Neither does the free coffee and the free printing and the nonsense that can go on in there at times. However, some of the side effects probably do, and again, I don't have a study for that, but the side effects of that are actually across services now, you see when you, when you watch the dynamics of uh, large veteran offices, they now recreate, enlisted I'm talking about, they largely recreate those social support networks across services and amongst ranks, so E3, former E3s, you know, crossing with E6s and E7s, that kind of thing. Some officers in there on occasion, but usually the officers stay away, do their grad school thing. And what's really powerful about that, one, is to, is to replicate that um, now in the college environment, but the other thing is, is if that's always happening, it's basically nine to five every day, you have enough to do that and a veteran is coming in and touring your campus, which is the best way to see if you're a good fit for a campus, you can come in right away and get truth, right? The, the veteran's office director is gonna give you the woof woof about the university, the recruiting people, admissions, they're gonna give you the woof woof. The veterans are gonna give you ground truth because they're not invested, right? They, they're gonna speak the truth. So that is the potential benefit of that. And so that is being replicated because I think culturally they know that there's a need for that. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, that was a great point and uh, definitely agree. I've seen it myself. Um, like you said, you know, recruiters are always going to sell you everything. They're going to give you all the bells and whistles. Um, so it's actually hearing from someone on the ground that's gone through the experience and being like, you know, hey, personally, I love this school. It's very theoretical. It's very academic minded. Um, but if you just want to become a school teacher, an elementary school teacher, like maybe you don't need to come to U Chicago. Maybe you can go to Illinois State or Southern Illinois or any other school, you know, and that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. So, great point. Thanks, Eric. Uh, great presentation. Um, yesterday, we talked about uh, we talked about kind of the narrative of the broken soldier, but also uh, I, I, at the opposite end of the spectrum, the idea, the narrative of, of the Superman or you know anyone who served, kind of. Uh, kind of fitting into that. Um, I don't know about in higher learning, so that would be my question, but I've seen in other areas where a barrier to kind of establishing those connections or that transition or reintegration is, is, is actually on the service member or the veteran themselves kind of, kind of you know, falling into that trap of, of, of that narrative of Superman and, and kind of so they, they make deliberate decisions to set them apart from those that they're trying to connect with because they may, maybe call it elitist or, or uh, perspective that they, they come into that with. So I guess my question is, uh, and I've seen it both on officers and enlisted, so I haven't seen a divide, but I've seen, I've seen uh, guys and gals unfortunately fall into that trap and it really is a barrier to their reintegration. Um, is that something uh, that you've seen in your research in, in higher learning? And, you know, is that a barrier sometimes uh, to that, uh, to those establishing those networks or connecting to those networks? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think I, I touched upon it briefly, so I'm glad you brought up. I can go a little bit more in depth. Um, but the individual barriers, like you brought up, uh, this Superman complex, the not necessarily refusal 
but the lack of going to someone for help when help is needed. Um, and I think a lot of this did emerge during our research, and a lot of it comes down to this idea of imposter syndrome, of having been in the military told that, you know, you can never be injured, you can never be wrong, you can never, you know, fail, to come to an academic environment, especially for maybe older uh, students, you know, in late 20s, early 30s, and you're like, oh, I need to go talk to an 18-year-old to get tutoring. Like, that feels like a failure on their part. It's, it's not, it's not a failure at all. Everyone's good at something. But kind of shifting that culture is very, very difficult. And individually, what we found was that this was especially difficult for enlisted members, former enlisted members. They have very hard times finding help. And what we found in our research was a lot of the barriers that they saw to like this social capital and developing it, they viewed it as an individual problem. They viewed it as something that they needed to do and they were failing at doing and they didn't know how to do it. Whereas officers, they viewed it as more positive. They viewed the as a communal thing, as something you know that was helpful towards them. Um, so I, I think it's something both sides struggle with, but it seems like the enlisted members had a much harder time of overcoming it. As far as why that is, I can speculate but it didn't emerge in the research. Um, I think it's something that we're gonna try and delve into further. Any other questions? Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking your time to listen and uh, thank you all for coming and thanks Dr. Owen for setting this all up. Thank you so much, Eric. Eric and I have the best conversations, him being a former Army medic and me being a, a Navy, former Navy corpsman, so we have the best conversations about who's better, and then of course the Army-Navy rivalry we do all the time. So, uh, and I wanted to add something to David's comment. So, in regards to the University of Chicago, we understand, again, you know, the, the officer community is more so heavily populated into the graduate units. However, University of Chicago, as many other graduate schools have been seeing more enlisted personnel going for their graduate programs. So it's a nice mix of enlisted persons, uh, former enlisted and former officers, I say, in our graduate programs as well. Uh, and then with the student groups, uh, specifically inside the graduate units, there are opportunities with, let's say, MASH, the Military Affiliated Students of Harris, very catchy name, thanks Zach. Uh, and then we also have the Booth Armed Forces Group, uh, which are student groups across the full-time, the evening, and the executive program, again, it's a mix of under, I'm sorry, enlisted and officers in that particular community in which we collaborate. Pat from our, uh, the president from our military affinity group is also here as well, which also addresses the enlisted and the former officers. So we, we mesh them together. Um, and speaking towards our skill bridge program that we just recently launched, uh, the University of Chicago will now start, has now, I should say, start accepting skill bridge interns from the DOD's program that allows active duty personnel to come to the University of Chicago and intern across various academic or administrative units. Uh, so we, our first intern is actually a re retiring colonel uh, who will be here. And as part of that skill bridge program, we're also going to assist them with transition. Uh, and for me, it's not just the university assisting them with transition. It'll be our students from the undergrad population. It'll be our students from the graduate program because they've been through those processes already. Uh, moving forward to our next panel, I'd like to invite up my friend Liz, Liz Bel Elizabeth Belcaster, I call her Liz, Liz Belcaster uh, from EMB Consulting, who's been working in this space for, I'm going to shoot and say 40 years, Liz. Oh, yeah. All right, 40 years of working specifically with veterans and their families, policy as it relates to the military affiliated community, et cetera. She is the catch all, be all for a lot of different areas. Uh, and has been a mentor to me for quite some time. So I'd like to invite Ms. Belcaster up. And uh, are you going to introduce her? Okay. And she'll introduce our panelists as well. Good morning, good afternoon, almost afternoon, right? Um, I'm a day late. I wish that I was here for some of yesterday's discussions um, simply because um, a lot of the discussion this morning was very interesting and it's all very relevant to 
um, the idea that transition really is a culture, right? Whether it's academic transition, um, whether it's going home to certain states and spaces and family, it's transition, um, or whether it's on the job training or skill bridge, which is what we're gonna talk about today, it certainly is a, a, a culture shock for many. So um, interesting conversation and great conversations this morning, so thank you. I am uh, gonna introduce our panel. I feel like I'm too short for this. Um, Dr. Cody Nichols. Um, Cody is with the University of Arizona, co-chair of Military and Veterans Working Group and Research Development Associate for National Security Programs with the University. Cody, welcome and thank you. Um, I believe that the university also holds a space with Skillbridge, is that correct? Yep, yep. And then we've got Lindsay, Lindsay, I don't wanna get bad on the, Shiro, Lindsay Shiro, who is with the Honor Foundation, and she is the director of people with Fort Bragg. I love that title, by the way. I wanna be the director of people as well. Um, thanks. And then we've got Candy Tillman, who is the CEO and founder of 50 Strong, and we'll hear more about what Candy's role has been in this space. Um, not, on, not intentionally, though, I don't think, right? So um, Skillbridge, I don't know if you all, anybody familiar here with Skillbridge? In the room? Okay, just about everybody. Well, that's good, then I don't really have to say anything. We'll just get on, no, I'm just kidding. So Skillbridge has been, um, kind of started out, I started my work in this space probably in 2008 um, when the economy had collapsed and the Department of Defense was paying millions, if not billions of dollars in unemployment. Um, I worked uh, locally here in Chicago as um, a political campaign manager. Lo and behold, I don't know how I got here today, but I often say if you can run a campaign in Chicago, you can do just about anything, right? Um, so my work was very much so with the unions um, based on the work that I did in political campaigns. I worked with a lot of the unions on endorsements and one of the bigger unions in Chicago had come to me and asked me if I would help them put together an event at Navy Pier um, that could really find a, a fine line to tune in some of our veterans in the state of Illinois to jobs. Um, and quite frankly, that's a whole other equation that was very interesting. At the time, there were no jobs, right? Industries were shut down, the Ford Motor Plants, um, jobs were scarce. Uh, but we knew that we had some federal funds coming into the state of Illinois for jobs with the Department of Transportation and other areas. So we kind of built upon that where, where we knew there was work, we had to put our veterans from Illinois to work, we had too many homeless veterans on the street. Um, so we kind of created this event down at Navy Pier, I think it was in 2008, 2009. We put 600 veterans to work that day, which was a really big dent in what was happening in Illinois and what was happening all over the country. So the formula kind of became that formula where, gosh, industry and military and now joining forces at the time, which kind of just opened up their doors to have this dialogue um, with military, civilian, academia, industry partners. That was the first time we ever really had these conversations, right? And I bet that many of you, or some of you in the room here were there for those conversations. Um, so, you know, that's really where this conversation of Skillbridge started. I think at some level, it was Dr. Jill Biden and Michelle Obama's First Lady Michelle Obama's efforts of joining forces um, that really needed to find a way to get people, in particular our veterans, many homeless veterans at the time, um, and then later on the conversation of our service members, transitioning service members, which is what we're here to talk about today. That's the Skillbridge program. Um, CSP is the Army's program, Career Skills program. That's really what launched the idea of DOD holding the space of having a Skillbridge program. The CSP programs were really the first time that industry and um, services, in particular the Army, had come together to talk about how we can fix this, this issue with the unemployment numbers, with unemployed service members, um, unemployed veterans, and quite frankly, um, homeless veterans and people with more bigger issues than that. That was really the stigma that was creating issues with addiction, issues with well-being, um, and so on. So. 2014, roll over, um, working very closely as I do every day with the Department of Defense and many of the services, um, sat down at a room in the Pentagon and talked about the Skillbridge program 
and quite frankly was there when they wrote the language for the authorization. And I'm happily here to say that, you know, today we are here to talk about the successes of Skillbridge and some of the partners that are doing such great work. So I'm going to take a seat here. I mean, I'm good with just standing up here. Um, but I'm going to take a seat and let some of my panelists talk about the great work that they're doing. So thanks, everybody. Okay, we got, yeah. So I'm going to start out with uh, Lindsay. I was happy to learn today, um, I've heard of your foundation, um, but got here and immediately was introduced to you and um, talked with you and Terrell for a few minutes. And I was really happy to learn just a little bit more, but I'm very excited to learn a lot more about what you guys are doing because it's very specific to special operations. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your foundation, what you guys are doing. Sure. So we are a 501c3 nonprofit, um, and we are nationwide. So we are actually headquartered out in San Diego, out west, and have uh, spread across the east now. Um, we are by campus, and so we support special operations and anyone under the Special Operations Command umbrella. Those are your Navy SEALs, your Green Berets, your Army Rangers. Um, and run a 12-week transition program to better prepare them for either higher education, for the civilian workforce, um, for a sabbatical, if they just want to enjoy that time and take that time to themselves after a 20-year military career. Um, and so we run a 12-week program, finding everything from finding their why and their purpose outside of their, mil their military experience, to doing logisticals as in LinkedIn and resumes and mock interviews. Um, and then we partner with, we have over 450 employee partners. Um, and so we work on connecting those dots and being the bridge between these veterans that are transitioning and the employment community that will hire them. How does the service member find out about your program and what does that process look like that for, the, for them? Um, are they directly connected to an employer as they're going through the program or is there the option of the employer? Tell me what that looks like. So every veteran comes through, it's a lot of word of mouth, it's an application process. Um, and so they apply, they have an interview, we require two letters of recommendation as well as a working resume. Um, and so that is just to complete and keep it tight knit. Each cohort as we call them, so every veteran goes through a cohort of 40, with 45 of their brothers and sisters who are transitioning as well. So they have that camaraderie, that brotherhood that you were speaking about, um, and so they work through it together. Each veteran that comes through our program has a one-on-one -on -one executive coach, and so they have, as well as the brotherhood and the camaraderie, a one-on-one -on -one experience as well. If they are interested in employers, we work with them. Um, we call them cups of coffee, and so it's very informative, very kind of, it takes the pressure off of them and gives them more of that educational experience to learn about company culture and networking and things of that nature as well. Is part of the conversation the pathway to get them there? Is if, if it's academic or if it's job training or an apprenticeship program, is that part of the education that you provide those individuals that go through your program? Yes, so it's not just you know to civilian workforce, it's higher education. We recommend that they come through our program 12 to 18 months before they actually transition. And so that way, during their terminal leave, they have that time to tour graduate schools and to interview and to write essays, and we help them with that as well. Um, or if they're going the employment route, it gives them time to network, to interview, and to find the right fit. So they're not scrambling once that employment date sets to find something that's gonna fulfill them next. And I think the reason I ask that is part of what we know is um, Service members are a lot of the time 180 days prior to their separation to find an employer partner through SkillBridge. Um, for the most part, the service member is not paying for these services, and at some level, they're really aligned specifically with a job or a pathway. Um, I think what we all see, and, and this is really the reason I asked that question, and, and to clarify, is that there really is no one size fits all with this, right? So you've got foundations like yourselves You've got specific employer partners. You've got third-party providers. Um, you've got unions and industry working together, or unions and contracted employers. Um, but at some level, the answer is really to get them to the finish line, which is really the job and or the pathway. I think based on even the earlier discussion with this panel here, um, it's really a challenge for everybody in this space, right? 
um, we talked and, and we heard a little bit from your panel about how the service member isn't necessarily always prepared. But I think what we miss a lot, what we're learning through Skillbridge, is it's the pathway that they're not prepared for. And quite frankly, that's not the job of the DOD. That's the job of us as individuals, as companies, as academic institutions, as foundations that are partnering. Um, one of the things that we've talked about quite a, few, qu quite a bit the last couple days and last couple weeks is that the DOD as the holder of the program, as the holder of the Skillbridge program, is responsible to the services who are speaking with their service members, they're responsible to the service members, but they're also responsible to all of us as providers, whether it's an academic institution, um, any provider that, that's really looking to service the service member, uh, but they're also responsible for vetting those individuals and those organizations as well. So um, I'm gonna kind of lean in and I'm gonna come back to you and talk a little bit to Candy. Um, Candy Tillman and I met through Skillbridge, quite frankly, and through a lot of work that we do together with the Department of Defense. And um, Candy's got a really interesting story and interesting perspective on how she got here um, as 50 Strong. And, and also, let's talk a little bit about your employer partners and the good work that you guys, and really the good work that 50 Strong is doing, Candy. Thank you, Liz. Uh, can you hear me? Um, so for purposes of this audience, you know, Liz mentioned that I came into the Skillbridge space very much on accident. Um, and so for this audience, I want to share a little bit with you about how and why 50 Strong started, which is also, you know, a large part of the reason that Cody and I work together so frequently. Um, my background is 20 years corporate, uh, Procter & Gamble, Henkel, SAP, Oracle, really large companies. Um, I, uh, in 2007, I fell in love with a transition service member and basically watched his story and it took him three years to find a steady job with a college degree. And over the next 15 years, I heard this story over and over and over again. And so four years ago, I left corporate and basically dove into the veteran services industry. That is what it is, make no mistake. But I dove in face first as an entry level congressional staffer doing veterans outreach for six months and I just absorbed everything I could about what was happening in the space, the 45,000 nonprofits, the role of policy and government. In this role, corporate partners, I think because of my background, were articulating this question to me. And I mean large corporate partners. They were saying, we want to hire student veterans and we're struggling to reach them at scale. I just want that to sink in for this audience because what happened was we had all these ideas about how we could help facilitate that and basically COVID hit. And at the time that COVID hit, we already knew we needed a virtual platform, right? So then COVID hit and it just kind of accelerated everything. And so um, we launched 50 Strong in August 2020 in collaboration with um, Amazon, ADP, Wells Fargo, Tech Systems, Cushman and Wakefield, a couple of others, and four university partners. Our concept originally started, and I'm sorry, I'll speed up, but our concept originally started with, can we connect military ready employers with student veterans at scale in a virtual environment? And can we do it across higher ed and across employers, right? So nobody's doing the heavy lifting. What happened is we started to hear from these same employers conversations around their other programs. And this is really how I got into the Skillbridge space. I'd been navigating as part of a congressional office, but I started to hear from Fortune 500 companies, we are churning with how to set up our Skillbridge programs. And I knew that if Fortune 500 were struggling, this means every small and medium-sized business is also gonna struggle. So 50 Strong's goal is to help military-ready employers. Indirectly, that helps student veteran service members, but that's really how and why we got started. So, sorry, that was a super long-winded way of answering. No, I think, I think everybody, you know, I think the question of the day is who's doing it right in the Skillbridge space? And then, you know, I know historically, as probably many of you do, 
Um, I started out, this is really going to age me, at the end of the Bush administration and then rolled over, really the very end of the Bush administration, rolled over Obama, Obama, Trump, and now Biden. Um, so what we've learned is that just like everything else, we've got a rollover that we've got to kind of do that same song and dance for the new people that come in, whether it's leadership from the military or it's administration. And so things change. In the eyes of programming, and especially in the eyes of the government, we talked about this this morning, this program is an infant, and it's forever growing, and we're seeing more and more industry partners, more and more of the Candy Tillman perspective, quite frankly. So um, there's a lot of changes happening even as we speak, but I think clarifying some of what the issues are ongoing and how excited we are that this program has grown so much. I mean, I That's personally, cool yeah, actually, Liz. yeah, please. So do. I have been tracking the number of programs, not the number of opportunities, the number of programs, the number of DOD authorized skill bridge programs has doubled since March of this year. What is happening is industry partners are running to this program. Why? Because it makes good financial business sense. Hiring, business, hiring veteran talent is not about goodwill right now. It's solid business sense. So the question becomes, how do you do it, right? The skill bridge program is revolutionary because the DOD continues to pay the salary. So basically, there was a comment before about how do we help corporate understand that maybe you might not need a four-year degree. I am seeing Fortune 500 companies for the first time ever relax degree requirements for service members that are coming in via SkillBridge. So what I'm saying is it's, it's a, it, it gives us so many options way ahead of time. And to go off your point, sorry, um, with the SkillBridge, and as you just said, it's taking away that degree requirement because for the first time ever, these Fortune 10, 500 companies are seeing what their work ethic is like. We've talked about it the last few days, how the work ethic of veterans is above you know, your average civilian. And so these skill bridge veterans are going in and joining these organizations and showing that firsthand with no financial deficit to these companies. And they're able to see what the veteran is going to bring them longevity wise rather than in the short term. Yeah, I've only personally seen that once. I mean, here's, for me personally, but what I will say is more and more companies are thinking about what is the innovation of this look like, 100%. Yeah, I, and I think it, that goes to say too for uh, Terrell, I know that he's standing up a skill bridge program as internship. I wanna reach now to Dr. Uh, Nichols and talk about the University of Arizona model. Um, I, you know, there's just some of us that have been in this conversation, especially the last couple months on doing a little bit more research on what the economic impact looks like. And Cody, you can probably talk a little bit about that. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but specifically, you know, this genre, this audience is really invested in the academic space, right? Um, so Cody, if you could talk a little bit about what the University of Arizona is and some of your personal stuff, I know the journey to get there is really interesting and exciting, and we're so happy to have you here today. Certainly, and thank you. And I, th I think the journey is you know, critical in that story as well. In my, in my previous role at the university, I worked directly with our military and veteran population for about nine years. At the University of Arizona, we've got a little over 2,000 veterans, a little over 4,000 people in our military and our veteran connected community. And we are at pace or exceed our non-student veterans uh, every year little different, sometimes we're a little ahead in retention, sometimes a little behind, same thing with graduation, to your point, Stephen points earlier. Uh, we do have a little bit of, I don't want to get off track, but we do spend a little time focusing on that transition out of the military and transition to higher education. You, you're in the military, you walk, talk, and read, and write, and all these sorts of things. Uh, from a technical perspective, we come into higher education, and now everything's academic, reading, writing, walking, talking, these sorts of things. So we focus on that, but we go straight into the career preparedness and most importantly, what our ultimate goal is, is meaningful employment for the folks that aren't necessarily just getting the degree because they've retired and they want a degree and they're gonna do whatever, but for the vast majority of our veterans and service members who are getting out, it's meaningful employment. That's our ultimate goal, that's our end space, right? So what we found over the years is our career services, in my opinion, were smart enough to know going back nine or 10 years, they didn't speak military, 
They didn't understand what military resumes were like. We happened to be right across the hall from them. They walked over and they said, and it was, here is Amazon. They want to hire veterans. Can you talk to them? Because we don't know what they're talking about. By all means, bring them in. So we started having a whole bunch of one-offs. Amazon, Raytheon, Bo I mean, you can go down the list. Cushman and Wakefield, you can go down the list. People coming in to sit down and have conversations with our veterans on our campus because they wanted to hire them because they know the skill set they bring. They know the leadership skills they bring, right? Our faculty on our campus tend to love the veterans. We were, I'm digressing. We were going through a uh, portion to all of our provost and dean's council, right? So think of a bunch of crusty old command sergeant majors that you're giving a presentation to, right? A few of you have got that, right? And so we're going through the what I would call the gloom and doom portion, right? We're talking about the suicide numbers, right? Which is a significant thing that you, you can't overlook. And the first hand goes up in the back of the room, and it was a dean of our business college who's since gone on to be a president of another university. He said, this is great and all. I appreciate this. This is important. We've got this great VA hospital here, and we know you're working with them. How do I get more veterans into my program? How do they challenge the professor's assumptions. Excuse me. They force the 18-year-olds reading the newspaper to pay attention in class. They take leadership roles within uh, the small groups. Right? How do I find more veterans into this? Right? So we're seeing all of these things. They're bucking what everybody was r running around telling everybody that we're broken, all these sorts of things, but rather we're in the front of the line. What we were also hearing was from veterans, all these veteran employers are out here. How do I get to the front of that line? Because what we were finding is a lot of our veterans uh, get in, transition in. I want to get a degree and I want to get out. Not interested, as you pointed out earlier, I'm going to steal a quote from my committee chair, veterans are not interested in all the frivolousness that happens on college campuses, right? They wanted to get a degree, it's a transitory time for them. They just lost that sense of self and that sense of purpose, moving on to something new, they want that degree. But how do I get to the front of the line? Well, what we were finding early on was our veterans were waiting until their senior year to start doing the things they needed to be doing four years ago or two years ago to be at the front of the line with the employers. Right? They need to be networking. They need to be engaging. They need the social capital that comes with that. They need to be practicing. They need to get the resume down, the interview, 30 second elevator pitch, all these sorts of things. But fast forward, it is really impossible for all of the employers out there to touch base on 6,000, a little over 6,000 colleges and universities. So, how do you help the employers out? and ultimately help our student veterans out on getting employed, you start looking at things like 50 Strong, where you're doing these things virtually and online where you can get it at scale. You start looking at SkillBridge and the SkillBridge opportunities for the services getting out. We have found, this is anecdotal, so don't judge me on this, right? We have found, but also through colleagues across the country, Jer uh, Jerry and Janine and others, right? The longer the veterans get away and can't, aren't identifying where they need to go and how they need to get there, the harder it is to get back on track. So the earlier you can touch and have those touch points, the earlier and more frequently you can connect, the better chances of earlier success. Enter SkillBridge. Get them before they even get out, right? Now, I know it was all over the place, so I'm going to wrap this up quickly, right? But so no, you I, you're absolutely right, though, and it is a conversation. I will say that um, some of the language that we hear in rooms like this um, go back to they do have the skill sets, you know, they're phenomenal. And you would think that, you know, for me, 15 years later, I still hear that in every room that I go into. But that is part of the issue is that you don't want them to lose those skill sets. We don't want life to get in a way, in, in a negative way, because there's already so much culture shock that comes with transition, right? So to your point, SkillBridge was really designed to be that. Um, Cody, it, it really was. That's really the, the mindset was that we had too many service members falling through the cracks as they were becoming veterans, as they were transitioning. So even though the unemployment numbers were at their highest because of the economy, we were also losing people because there was no, you know, there was no pathway in transition. So you're exactly right. Yeah. Well, interesting. So Candy talked about some of the benefits for businesses and um, of course, we all know it's the early access to service members and candidates. And a little bit on that, the side of that is um, I was party to one of the first SkillBridge programs that ever launched in 2015. And one of the things that comes with early access to, whether it's an academic institution or employer, 
is responsibility. And that's really something that we all talk about a little bit on how vetting process for employers, we don't want to throw it out there that everybody um, everybody that's in business can, can qualify to become a provider. We really need to hold those standards high. And part of all of our jobs on this panel is at some level making sure that those employers understand what that high bar looks like. Um, I remember we had instructors, I stood up a program with a company called ABF and it was truck driver training uh, with the Teamsters and we had instructors that were moving you know, from their homes from Washington State all the way to Hawaii, coming to Fort Riley, Fort Sill, and Fort Carson, the three places that we launched at. And part of the conversation we had was you have to reverse what your mindset of is as an instructor. Um, these individuals are still on the arm of the, uni the United States government. Um, you are privileged to be on this installation, and you should treat it as such. So a lot of that reversed when it was just installation training. I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about some of the partners that you guys work with and what that vetting looks like in your eyes from your perspective. And we'll start with you, Lindsay. Sure. Um, employee partners. So our people team, um, we have a people and programs team. Okay. So we, the people team does both. We vet them. Um, so we have, we meet with them, we network. We're very big on network, network, network from the beginning. That's how you're gonna, you know, take that next step. Um, and so we have a vetting process. We have what's called our mentors and they are, you know, industry professionals or have connections to, you know, Fortune 500 companies or et cetera. And they work directly with our fellows, as we call them, going through our program. And so if someone is interested in an Amazon or a Google or even a smaller JP Morgan Chase, we have mentors in those capacities that then work with them to network, to make the connections for them, to uh, tailor their resume, to kind of help them in a funnel to that specific employment status. Sure, I read on your, um, on your website that you guys, um, what prompted you guys just very specifically with your foundation why special operations? What kind of prompted that conversation? Sure. So I'll go into a little background about myself as well. So we were founded actually in around 2014 by a guy named Joe Musselman who was in Navy SEAL training and failed Navy SEAL training. He didn't make it through. And he got out and realized that there was no specific transition institute for special operations. Special operations you know, have years and millions of dollars tr of training by our government and our DOD invested into them. Where are we coming on the outside of that? They offer a specialized individual to employers. Um, so he tailor made it, starting with the Navy SEAL community and then spread across all of the um, SAW. And so we go from Air Force to Army to Marines to Navy now. Um, my background, my as I mentioned yesterday, my husband was wounded in Afghanistan in 2014, and so I saw his mental health and his transition. Um, I originally partnered with Purple Heart families and testified in front of Congress for um, the Purple Heart recipients and the support for their family, specifically in the mental health capacity. Um, he medically retired and I saw that transition of not only the veteran, but the disabled veteran and the kind of extra steps that they have to go through to obtain purpose and deployment and overcoming the mental health um, aspect of that all. And so um, worked with a variety of military nonprofits in a consulting way and then joined the Honor Foundation specifically to help Green Berets on, at Fort Bragg. So it's primarily a special forces community over there and Green Berets specifically and help them trans transition into the civilian world. Um, first of all, thank your husband and your family mm -hmm. for everything that you're doing. I think it's really important and I think that um, interestingly enough, I think a lot of the people that get involved in this at some level have that connection to somebody in the military or a family member that goes through it. So for those reasons, um, we'll probably prevail and succeed with SkillBridge because we have a lot of great people monitoring and watching out and, uh, and that goes for all of our services too. Um, that's a great story. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Candy, talk a little bit about some of the vetting that 50 Strong does. Yep. And I know for you it's both the service members that engage. You know, just really quick to your point, um, I love the idea that special operations is really a focus because one thing that we probably all know is that service members don't tend to self-identify, right? 
um, no matter how heavy combat they served or if they were cooks in the military, they don't come in and unless they've got medals on or stripes on, they're not coming into your place of employment or your academic institution with their uniform on. And quite frankly, sometimes it's up to them to self-identify. And the fact that you guys have r really chosen that elite special operations folks that come from that space, I'll bet it's um, really wonderful for your partners to identify with them as that. So um, that being said, we talked a little bit earlier too about the enlisted service member who really struggles in this space. Um, we, we would think that somebody from special operations would be able to navigate their way through, but I think we work a lot with yeah. some of the enlisted individuals, and Candy, I'll turn it over to you, thanks. So we, our goal at 50 Strong is really to help employers be self-sufficient in their skill bridge programs. And so some of our largest partners, frankly, that are making 50 Strong possible, um, I'll use Lowe's as an example. Um, Lowe's recently shared at a 50 Strong event, their military lead recently shared at a 50 Strong event, that any Lowe's store in this country can be considered a SkillBridge location for service members to go participate in SkillBridge as training pathways to assistant store managers. I don't know if anybody knows how much assistant store managers at Lowe's makes, but it's pretty nice, right? My point is they have they have a virtual computer-based training program combined with in-store training. It's flexible. They start it every single month, right? So it's aligned to service member timing. Um, this is an example of a pathway that a service member may not have previously considered. Oh, by the way, a college degree is not a requirement. Um, I have another partner, uh, United Health Group, a Fortune 10 company. They have skill bridge opportunities open across business functions in every state in this country. Uh, we also work with smaller employers, right? So I have an employer that basically articulated, we have a need to hire residential real estate appraisers across this country. They are using SkillBridge to certify them as residential real estate appraisers. They will roll out virtual training next year to do this, which means nationwide plus full-time employment on the back end. These are really strong jobs. Um, I also want to mention we there's a really important vibe kind of with the partners that I work with, which says the rising tide lifts all. So all of my employer partners are very invested in sharing their knowledge and their best practices with other employers because we all believe, right, the more that we can all learn and share together, the less, the less churn we'll have on the employer side, right, which then just opens opportunities for service members. But the other really important part that we do is every month we host 50 Strong Skill Bridge Connect. And so we'll have you know, 15 to 20 different skill bridge providers come join these virtual events. We invite service members in. We could have between four and 500 registering every month. We pre-share all the roles at the city state level. And then what happens is service members can navigate based on what's available in, the, in their post-military location and go and meet with the skill bridge leads at each of these organizations. It's basically kind of like speed dating, right? Um, and we're seeing people come out uh, of these meetings with interview requests for skill bridge opportunities. Um, it's easy, right? Nobody has to travel anywhere, and it's basically opt-in. It's super casual. We're seeing 80% of the folks that opt-in are E7 or below. And so the, the idea is I want all ranks to understand there are pathways for them in every industry in Fortune 500, in small and mid-sized companies, in the labor unions. like, But we, we need people to know that there are more options for them other than just attorneys, doctors, and teachers, right? Cushman and Wakefield is a great example of an innovative leader in this space. Matt Disher shared recently that they have 24 SkillBridge candidates this year alone. The salary representation of that is $1.8 million for one company. And they're not even Fortune 500. But these are roles across uh, maintenance, right? These are project management, business analysis. Cushman and Wakefield is not a company that I had heard of, frankly, before I started working with them. And I've been in corporate for 20 years. So I haven't heard of them. 
guarantee you service members haven't heard of them. And they have worked so hard to be relevant that four of every 10 service members that reaches out to me mentions Cushman and Wakefield when they reach out because they've done such a good job to maintain that relevancy. Um, I don't even remember what the question was, Liz. Yeah, no, I think it's just there, that. I think we're just trying to identify <laughs> yeah. what some of those successful pathways look like. Yep. Um, you know, that economic um, equation that we've all been talking about, quite frankly, it was Terrell and myself and um, who had an early conversation about uh, one of the programs that I started in 2015. Um, we were actually two programs, in one here in Chicago, that's really a good model. That's where Terrell and I, quite frankly, met. Um, and the, the last speaker that talked about vet reps and the, the research that you did on some of that and how important that was for social networking and colleges and, 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 and even in employer space, those spaces are very important and relevant. Um, when we first started uh, a program here in Chicago, the Utility Workers Military Assistance Program, which quite frankly has trained and placed over a thousand veterans and service members since 2012 with People's Gas here in Chicago. These are the kind of partnerships that just are common sense. I mean, it just makes so much sense. And if really we could, as industry partners and stakeholders, industry by industry come together, um, these success stories would be much higher. And, and I think we're getting there, quite frankly. But Terrell, um, at that point, my point about the vet rep, City Colleges at the time when I started that program with Rick Castro, I didn't start it, I was a partner to it. Um, but, it but we're very proud of the program. Um, had only one vet rep for the entire city colleges at a time where we had, you know, 15% unemployment for veterans. And in academia and that space, whoever talked about that early on, just that space of having another service member or veteran there to talk to was critically important at the time. So really Terrell kind of came in and, and solved that problem. And I said, if nothing else in 2012, if that's all we did back then is got city colleges to put a vet rep in every city college, I would have been happy with that. Turns out we did a lot more than that. So um, Cody, I wanna come back to you and I wanna hear a little bit more about um, some of the efforts. You had talked about early on about the, the conversation between somebody saying Amazon's trying to recruit. Tell me a little bit more about what that looks like in your space. And quite frankly, Terrell, you should have been on the panel up here because I think it's interesting, the collaboration of what universities are doing with SkillBridge uh, via the internships, how does that roll over into the job and how do we identify the correct pathways for those service members transitioning, coming from SkillBridge to come into your space? Uh, certainly, well, I mean, the short answer to the correct pathway is really working with that service member to where they're trying to go and how you're gonna work with them to get there, whether it's through education, whether it's directly to, to uh, a career, you know, employment or what have you. but. You know, having spent a whole lot of time with a whole lot of one-off conversations because that was the best method we had at the time, being able to have this virtual really expedites the process for networking and connecting opportunities with getting even further deep right back into when they're still a service member in the DOD, finding those opportunities. And in our case, on our campus, uh, it's a very intentional, it's small numbers, it's making sure there's mentors that are working with them, not necessarily just the the job that they're sliding into, for lack of a better term, or where they're having that skill bridge opportunity, right? We've got folks across campus. We've got folks working with psychology professors. We've got folks in, in a variety of places on our campus, right? But it's getting them aligned with the right people and making sure that we on the backside that are more managing the program on our campus are making sure the mentorship conversations, these opportunities are having them, uh, we're having as well. We already know institutionally that, and we have an I, we're going to have an IT problem in the very near future in terms of IT support. Just low numbers. We need more folks who can come in that can handle the IT infrastructure on our campus. So we already know that's one place we're gonna be looking at the SkillBridge program. We already know, it was brought up earlier, our facilities uh, staff in a whole variety of areas is gonna have a huge number of folks retiring in the next two years, so we know if we can get in front of that, it's good for the service member transitioning out who's looking for careers in those fields. It's good for the university because you have a certain amount of time before they're even with you to get them trained up and go, and, and go straight in, uh, into, the, into work with the university. Yeah, I think what's really important, and I think there's a lot we're gonna learn from the 
university and community colleges and the space of how Steelbridge holds up for those individual transitioning service members that come into it. Um, I, I'd be curious too, I think that we all kind of work in the space of tools, right? Is there enough tools out there? Are there too many tools? Is there too much for the service member to navigate through? And um, I think we're all seeing that that self-identifying space is really important in order to get them on the correct pathways. And when it comes to a degree program or a four-year program, um, what does that pathway look like? I think in, er, in an earlier conversation, too, we had talked a little bit about is the service member prepared for college? Um, is the service member prepared for industry? Is the service member prepared? It's really our responsibility to do that at some level and to engage them in a way where it makes sense. But I think, to somebody's point earlier as well, um, it can't be a part-time position. That was your point, sir. Um, I think one of the things that we've seen that is successful over the years is that leadership from the Amazon CEO to the president of the AFL-CIU labor unions and all of those leadership roles that not only are they engaged um, and giving people um, in their space the authority to work with those services and with the DOD and with others, um, I think that's relatively important. Really having an authority behind it, not just a staffer that's coming in as I'm the military liaison and there's no discrimination there. It just really needs to come from the top down in order to make good policy decisions within your own organizations, um, in order to make pathways that are acceptable so that that staffer doesn't have to go through 30 channels in order to get the service member from there to there, right? Um, so yeah, that's just another interesting space. The other thing that we talked about is about the benefits to business, and I'm just reading off some notes from a DOD event that I was at and, and printed this out, is just the extensive experience and skills. We kind of all know what that looks like, right? Um, anybody on the panel want to feed into that for some of your employers? What does that look like for them? Especially the special operations, I guess. Um, an employer really kind of knows what they're getting at some level, um, but how does that work for your employers in identifying um, some of what those skill sets? Is it very, quite frankly, I just don't think that there's enough of it where employers are really understanding. We talked about years ago, it was everybody reading a DD-214. Um, hopefully, these electronic tools that are coming out and some of the tools even with the within the DOD um, will help self-identify what those how those skill sets relate to the industries that they're going into. But um, Candy, for some of your folks, what does that look like? You know, I'll just start by saying the majority of people that come out of the military separate versus retire. And I think a lot of the voices that we tend to hear are the officers that retire or maybe even the senior enlisted that retire. Uh, the majority, again, the majority of people that come out are separating junior enlisted. They may be first generation college students. They won't have the network that you talked about. Um, let's not forget that the majority of our workforce needs are probably more relevant for the junior enlisted coming out after four or six years than they are for, a, I mean, this is just the reality, right? It's, an, it's a numbers game at this point. And so really from a workforce development strategic perspective, the question becomes if the majority of people that are coming out are junior enlisted, and oh, by the way, the little bit of research that I've seen says that they are less likely to opt into services than anybody else, particularly nonprofits. Thank you for confirming that. But that's who our workforce needs, then this means that this is a group that we have got to reach early. One of the things that I'm seeing is the employers, it's again, I just wanna reiterate this, military ready employers already know the talent and the skill, right? They also are very much of, listen, if somebody worked on an aircraft I can train them to work on an HVAC system at a large commercial property, right? Um, and so I think it's really just this context of how do we match up the workforce needs with the talent coming out? Listen, there's a lot of MOS translators and a lot of easy buttons. The reality is the work still has to be done because we don't know if people wanna do what their MOS was, right? And I believe that we shouldn't lock them in. So I think that military ready employers are really taking a hard look and saying, this program is so revolutionary for all of us. How do we really work together to make it work? And so I really see a lot of passion 
for junior enlisted. I really do. And this excites me because I, I want, this is the group that we have to figure out how to serve for our workforce needs, but also because of the scale of it. Um, I'll also just say that uh, when we have 80% of folks that attend our events that are, that are E7 or below, this gives me so much pleasure because what it tells me is when we bring the jobs to them, they will opt in. They may not opt into services, but they will opt in when there's an outcome on the back end. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think too, um, you know, as far as engagement with enlisted and some of the tools that are out there, I, I do want to reference to the Makaya, the Military Credentialing um, Advancement Initiative that Terrell and Sam Whitehurst here, a uh, few of us participated in with the Legion and the Lumina Foundation to really identify some of the best practices for that transitioning service member, whether it was in relation to a credential with an academic institution or whether it was in relation to a job training to placement program. There are some really great models in there. That's at legion.org slash Micaiah. Um, but there's also a lot of information on some of the best tools. And that was really um, the, the information in that report is really the most updated, defined information on the tools that have worked best and models that you can utilize for a skill bridge. And as Candy was saying, I think we're all, you know, like, hey, come on over. We can talk about it. Uh, let's help you get up and running. Um, quite frankly, we've, we've got a lot of service members um, that, and especially our enlisted, that get lost in this process. And I think that this has really been um, a milestone for them. And for the DOD, you know, managing this is a lot of work. <laughs> and we need to make sure everybody's out there talking to their congressmen and to their folks independently, state by state, to remind everybody that these people that are all party to this DOD program, the services, the service members, and the providers, we really need to make sure we're funding this well as well. We often get into this space with these great ideas and then somebody from the next administration comes in or somebody from the next you know, military leadership space comes in and they get lost because there's other, um, other things that are happening, so yeah. Uh, to add to the benef another benefit of SkillBridge um, is through the special operations community, a lot of them, um, unlike getting out of the junior enlisted, stay in for full 20 because they've dedicated years of their life training. And so we work on effectively translating that 20 years of military experience into business operations, project management, program management. But another benefit of the skill bridge is that they have the opportunity to find a niche that they may have not otherwise been interested in. So many of them spend you know, 20, 25 years in a specific MOS. They don't wanna do that, but they don't know what else to do. And so it gives them that further opportunity to explore different avenues that they would have not been able to explore prior. Yeah, it's interesting if you, ex if you talk about somebody that's got a 20 year career, right? So there's a whole bunch of paper and boxes to check and places to go with that 20 year career. Imagine just the opposite end of that being the enlisted who's got those two years and even themselves doesn't necessarily know how to take that and put it into to the industry space. So I think there's tools that we all learn from with each other, right? At some level that the theory behind how you navigate that special operations person is the same theory that we should be looking at with those enlisted members and, and that's overall we should be doing that. Cody, did you wanna add to that? I, well, in addition to that, sure. I, I suppose. So one of the things that we haven't quite touched on yet, and I missed my cue earlier, Liz, and Candy touched on it. That's okay. I've been noodling in my mind whether we bring it up again. And Terrell, I'm, I'm trusting because we've talked about this beforehand, I can say what I'm about to say, right? But one of the things we haven't discussed yet is, and how f I should know this, how far, how many years are we into the Skill Bridge program? Uh, started in 2015, so we're six years in. So we're six years into the. Yeah. So we're six years into the program. We've got numbers from Cushman and Wakefield. I'm sure that industry is tracking this, or they wouldn't be doing it. We've got numbers from. How many years program. did it take? And this is not a knock on SBA, but how many years did it take us to get data on? You just talked about it earlier. To get data on veterans, right?
and that was concerted efforts by the SBA to try to get that information. It took a long time. Right. So to that point, one of the things we don't want to get too far behind on is the research piece. And so we've had initial conversations with the University of Chicago, with Liz and the City College, with, with Candy, the University of Arizona, that we need to start looking at the numbers. What are the success rates, most importantly, from my perspective, for our transitioning service members, but also for the industry, right? The economic impact for the country, right? So we need to start looking at that information sooner than later. And so that's one of the things that are, when I think of next steps, before we are way too far behind that and have to start digging ourselves out, we gotta start paying attention to that. We gotta start learning from that uh, the sooner than uh, the sooner the better. It's super, super important. You know, as, as programs grow and as you have advanced investment from employer partners, from academic institutions, um, from nonprofit foundations that are really putting their heart and soul in this for all the right reasons. You know, I often say a good program is never gonna be a great program if it's based on moral compass. It's gotta be a good business model. And that, quite frankly, is just, it is what it is. Um, we've seen a lot of programs fail because their moral compass is this high, but the business model doesn't work. And quite frankly, it's probably better that those programs are not because they're not working. Somebody gets caught up in the middle of it, right? Um, that being said, I think the original conversation was Terrell and I talking about how much um, and salaries has been put out the door to all of those thousand veterans that were serviced by the utility workers program. That number to date is over $62 million in salary. Imagine if you think about industry by industry, every skill bridge provider that's out there that can provide a number like that. We've even broke it down to the equation of how much was the original investment into the program. It's 11 to one. I mean, it really is that number but you think about how all of those salaries have impacted the communities in which these veterans live in. Uh, industries that are thriving because they've been able to pull in this great talent. Retention for these companies looks so different because these are individuals that are committed. They've spent a good amount of time somewhere within that 180 days prior to their separation, investing their time in getting that job and that career pathway. So. Cody, you're so right, it's so important, and Terrell and, um, and Cody and Candy, I can't wait to continue to that work, and we would welcome anybody else's um, input on that. I think it's super, super important. And not to be melodramatic about it, but in my current role at the university with national security related research, this is, the, the employment piece is a piece of it, right? Because DOD recruitment and retention is in some part gonna be driven in the future by how we treat our veterans, right? So the better we do our veterans, the better the DOD is gonna have, I mean, look at it now, less than 1% of the population is currently serving in the DOD. The vast majority of the folks going into the DOD are coming from their families. That's a significant civilian military divide. What that looks like in 10 or 20 years from now, I don't know, right? But my point being, the better we take care of the folks getting out of the military, the better we are as, as a society. Lindsay, go ahead and then Candy, Candy I'll throw it back to yeah. you. To, so to add to your point, um, and I think the overarching idea here in this room is how to better support our veterans going into high, higher education. We have uh, this motto in the Honor Foundation, you cannot start transition too early. Um, but you think of now in 2021, the war in Afghanistan just ended. We have 20 years of veterans that are now looking to transition that started and signed up right after 9-11 and they're now getting out, whether that 10 year, that five year, that seven year mark, um, what is their purpose after that? They signed in for a purpose. How are we helping them? Transition is not necessarily, you know, going to higher education and getting a degree or getting, it's fine, it's something so much deeper than that that I think, you know, needs to be discussed openly and yeah, I think it's part of the life cycle. I know that, um, you know, part of one of the organizations, Dixon Center, Sam, that's here today, one of the things that we all do, and I think all of the organizations do, but I think it's really important to identify that those wraparound services within there, it's part of the life cycle of transition is life, right? It becomes that as well. Um, whether it's going home to family that they haven't been with in, in some amount of time, um, transitioning the culture of being back home with their kids or their parents or 
in an area that they never thought that they would go ho call home to because of the job. So there's so many influences and having some of that, that built into the programs is really critically important. Go ahead, Sandy. Yeah, and you know, I just wanna say, even this week we've had conversations about employment is just one part of transition, right? 100% understand that. I will also say for those that don't have a pension, that bottom rung of Maslow's hierarchy of need is incredibly important, right? So I hope my, my, in my imagination that there are pathways to employment for every single service member that they come out clearly marked for them to explore. And so while employment is just one part of transition, employment can be really critical for certain groups. And, you know, I, I also just want to say that what I continue to hear from military-ready employers is that SkillBridge is such a revolutionary answer to the question of veteran employment. And so many, sorry, so many employers don't, I was talking to Candy about this yesterday, don't even know how to achieve a skill bridge opportunity. Okay. And there's still that gap of, you know, very large employers that are still, don't know the hurdles they have to jump or the verification process they have to go through. So even starting, you know, from the veteran side, yes, but like what the work you're doing from the employer side of getting those Step. Employers have just as many questions as service members do, right? And there are, you know, getting the authorization from the DOD is one part of it. There is HR compliance of having basically non-employees as part of your organization. There are considerations of how does a skill bridge leader effectively work with a hiring manager? What is the right level for that skill bridge leader so that they can articulate the business case? How do they work with their veterans ERG to recruit, mentor, onboard. So there's all these considerations that employers are still, c large ones are like, wait, how do I do that? And so, but what I, again, there are so many employers that are kind of willing to work together to share that knowledge. And I mean, what they all say is, there is no competition when it comes to veteran employment because they, are, they all know what transition looks like, right? So if you look at um, the issues that we're having with supply right now, supply chains and, um, you know, getting things from port to, to, to cargo and all of what's happening within the economy that we are forever trying to grow, the jobs that we're trying to build back better, right? Um, let's bring more jobs to America. Um, let's spend a billion dollars on building climate and uh, environmental efforts uh, to make our country better. Uh, but the, the real issue is we can't fill the space that we have right now. Um, there is so much competition and workforce and I will say that we talked yesterday at the utility worker space with some of the student veterans and we often do these assessments with each class cohort by cohort like you guys have. And when I first started doing this, um, some of the early conversations that we had with that first cohort with utility workers and people's gas was, you know, I'm living in my car. You know, I don't have a home. Um, my family's living with somebody else because I don't have any money and they gotta live there and I gotta live here. That was the early conversations because there were no jobs. Yesterday, we had a class and, and a cohort and I think three of them had master's degrees. Two of them had bachelor's degrees. Um, they ranged from an E6 all the way to an E3. And what was the most interesting is that um, the question asked again of this cohort 27, that was cohort one, that I talked about. Cohort 27 is, well, how did you get here? What were you doing before? Well, you know, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And it was kind of like a millennial answer, not in a bad way, um, where they were trying to figure it out, but they, this was their choice. So we come full circle from that homeless veteran to now a thriving workforce, almost too big, too many options, right? So what co compartment do we put our service member in or wor what compartment does he choose from now that there's such a competitive workforce space out there too. So it really is interesting to see where it started and, and where it's come to and um, to see the choices that service members are, are, are making. And I think um, from my perspective, again, I think it's really a great responsibility that DOD has, uh, quite frankly, to be the holder of the program. But we are the folks that will be reminding um, DOD and others that the responsibility is really to the service member 
and even for myself and for all of you here on this panel, I know part of their responsibility is to make sure that the employers that they're partnering with, um, the academic institutions that are taking on that process, that they are holding those individual organizations and companies responsible as well. Make sure you set the bar high, make sure you do it right. Um, and I think I'll just give everybody a few minutes to close on that. I think we're just about done, right, Terrell? Yeah. Uh, oh, and questions, but uh, Candy or, or uh, Lindsay, let's start with you maybe just some closing comments. Sure. Um, I mean, I think it, you know, having Candy and myself and uh, Dr. Neal here is the both sides of the coin um, and how we are preparing our veterans early. We cannot expect our veterans to leave military service and specifically combat service and expect them how to be perfect students and expect them to know how to integrate with civilians and not have any repercussions from that in the long term. Um, and how we cannot expect employers to equip to work with these veterans and how to use their skill sets and capitalize on their skill sets and do all these things for them. Um, and so it's kind of, it goes both ways in my opinion on educating employers you know, educating the veteran um, and how can we come together? And, and that's why I think Skillbridge is that in the middle line of how we come together and educate both parties. It really brings all the parties together at some level to learning what academia is doing it wor versus the apprenticeship training or the training to placement space. Um, we even talked yesterday a little bit how nothing should be so divided that they can't see. They can only go one way or the other, you know what I mean? We really need to marry academia up with industry a little bit better than what we're doing. That is a critical, critical need, and it falls friendly to the state of our economy, how we will thrive, how our citizens will, thri will thrive as well. So, Candy? Um, you know, the first Skillbridge Canada I ever placed was in, hi was in higher ed. Um, and so I thought I'd just give a couple of ideas about how higher ed institutions could maybe start easily with SkillBridge. Um, first, the good news is, is that service members are now starting to become more and more aware. But for your active duty currently enrolled students, please encourage them to leverage SkillBridge opportunities as part of career readiness, right? This is the, my biggest ask. So that's first, right? That's an easy ask. And then I think, you know, as employers, what are the open opportunities that you may have that have really good employee onboarding processes that maybe you could have a couple of roles, maybe you open them up as a third party if you're not ready to go sign an MOU with the, with the DOD, but think about are there opportunities that you could offer just as a kind of a pilot, right? And then, you're all working with your local industry partners, right? Your local smaller employers. So maybe think about, and this is what the University of Arizona has done, think about how you can be a really strong community partner for your employers, right? To help them kind of navigate the skill bridge process. Certainly, you know, military ready. When Cody's talking about research, to me, this is like military ready for a university, right? When we're starting to think about what are the curriculum opportunities? What are the, the research opportunities? but Nobody has, not everybody has to run there right away. There are easy kind of ways to get started. I'm gonna be very quick because I've got a thing about being late and this thing is blinking red <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the stage. And I've got three small kids, so I'm always late. So being late, I, always, I start twitching when, when I'm late. The very quickly, because I know, I know there are questions and I, we didn't get a chance to talk about the community piece with that. More than happy to take your questions uh, after the fact, but the one thing I'll say, largely speaking, is obviously the most important thing from all of our conversations we've had yesterday and today is, is I mean, we all can't be everywhere and everything for everybody, but what do we do tomorrow after the boat cruise? What do we do when we go home, right, and get back into our communities and start having those conversations with folks? So I will leave it uh, at that, thank you. That's been staring me in the eyes this entire time. <laughs> Any questions, guys? save my, my comments, but I do have questions from the, the viewer online. Looks like Jonathan from William and Mary, and I don't have my glasses. So from 50 Strong's perspective. Hi, JD. <laughs> oh, so have you seen non-skill bridge opportunities emerge from the interaction at scale that you are cultivating? And then the secondary question looks like it's here for everyone. 
in terms of student veterans, who have you seen are the best candidates to explore DOD skill bridge opportunities? So I don't think that there's any best candidates, to be honest with you. I don't think that there's any, you know, one size fits all, as I said earlier. Uh, but I'll lean into the rest of the panel to respond as well. Uh, Terrell, the first question again that, that he asked. Sorry. Have you seen non-skill bridge opportunities emerge from the interaction at scale that you are cultivating? Um, I'm not sure, JD, if you mean that within higher ed or on the employer side, but I will say yes to both. Uh, I am seeing employers that get so excited about the skill bridge program that it is literally the first military outreach they've ever done as part of talent. Um, I'm also seeing the same thing in higher ed. So, you know, this is a great example. Uh, Cody and Terrell have both leaned into SkillBridge. And now as we're starting to think about research as a next step, right, with corporate partners engaging on that, this is certainly opening up doors. Thanks for uh, the chat. This was incredibly, and I'll tell you how incredible I think this was. The last time I was this excited about something that's going on for veterans. Oh no. It was 2008 and I was separating and learned about this new thing called the post 9-11 GI Bill. There's been so much eyewash between now and then that this really gets me excited. Can you bottle that up? And you can have it. You, you can have it because the other side of the hammer is coming right now. So <laughs> stay, stay seated. Um, so. I like to broad brush, I like to make a point, and I, 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 I do it for a reason. So we just talk, made the point about there's moral initiatives, but it has to be a good business practice. This is a great moral initiative. It's not yet reached the level. You all are in the middle of it, right? But I can tell you broad brushing. Military members don't know about SkillBridge. Those of us who've been working in the field for 13 years doing this don't know about SkillBridge. Corporate America does not know about SkillBridge. Some do. Right, the way that this is gonna succeed, and I don't know if you all are in charge or influence the people who are in charge, is business partners, Lowe's and whoever, have to stomp on the ground and talk to other business partners. That is the only way this is really gonna succeed. And I, that's the key to making this transformative. And that's how it's grown. You are yeah. spot on, and that's how it's grown is corporate America. So I'll say, you know, the, the big conversation is more about industry stakeholders, you know, especially now as you get into this whole um, push for supply chain and industry by industry, who are those stakeholders that sit at the table that have manufacturing jobs? The manufacturing institution, quite frankly, has got, you know, X amount of employers, much like everybody else, that's doing their own thing and engaging, but it really is got to be industry driven, it's got to be driven by stakeholders within the industry. And quite frankly, I will say enough of the states aren't doing what they should do with this. This should be a part of every Department of Veterans of, uh, um, Employment Space, Veterans Affairs Office. If I've got, you know, 50 service members coming home to Illinois, there's nothing that they're, that's checking the spot what for are that. Even lower than that, yeah. or smaller than that, what are military installations doing? Yep. How are they sharing it at yeah. the installation, not even the state level, at the installation level through TAPS or GSP or things of that nature? What are they doing? For the Army's but doing a really good job with it, I will say that, because they kind of started it as CSP, and they're still calling it CSP. Uh, Coast Guard just kind of got authority to be part of SkillBridge, um, but they, this is a problem that we have, just like big employers, big military installations and institutions don't have the manpower to get information out there. It's more mission focused. Hang on. And I think that that is part of the issue. Part of what we're seeing right now, which is why it's always exciting to sit here and talk to you about it, is that we do need more folks to go out and talk to their own communities, to talk to the service members, the military installations, even your ROTC programs at some level. This needs to be talked about. That needs to be that. Go ahead. But I do just want to remind us all in 2019, there were 140-ish DOD authorized skill bridge programs. In 2019, during COVID, we sit at almost 1,400 in 18 months. And so I 100% agree with you. We, are, we have so much room to grow, but the last 18 months have been phenomenal growth. 
It has, but I, I do agree with you. I don't think enough service members, either they don't know about it or they're not navigating it appropriately. You know, we, we had just had a conversation that we need to get like in a big room somewhere and just go, this is Skillbridge for the service member, this is Skillbridge for the employer, and this is what we expect from our partners, from agencies, and because um, you're absolutely right, but I, I appreciate your comments, sir. I Thank mean, you. Also, the chain of command is already there. And the chain of command has to buy in. 100%. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. It already is. But I also think, too, is making it easier for the service member to research organizations to say, you know, picking something up, Chase, for instance, J.P. Morgan Chase, saying, I want to intern with J.P. I am interested in what they have to offer. And J.P. Morgan Chase coming back and saying, okay, how do we do this skill bridge? Let's sign this up. Let's get it. So it's a two-way street and a conversation that needs to be happening between the veteran and the employer and themselves. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I have two questions, but um, to kind of give preference for the first one, pre Pre-COVID, women veteran unemployment actually increased while male veteran unemployment decreased. What is Skillbridge doing to kind of make sure they're tracking the progress for all veterans within different demographics to ensure that the program is actually successful for all veterans? So Skillbridge independently services all veterans, right, or all service members at any level. Um, there has been a, a real focus um, th with this administration about spouses and female veterans and really making sure that there's inclusion. Part of that inclusion, quite frankly, is industry as well. Industry needs to make a greater effort to make women inclusive into opportunities, in my opinion, and I think that the numbers across industry would define the same thing, quite frankly. So I think that everybody's open for ideas. Again, DOD is kind of the authority um, it's really up to the partners at some level to scale more into that. I completely agree with you, and I do know the numbers, and, and I appreciate that question. Anybody else? And this is why we need research. Because it's not being tracked. Yep. Okay. Your and then second my question. <laughs> my second question actually was something that was mentioned about pigeonholing vet, um, veterans, specifically enlisted veterans, into the careers that they were doing while in service. I was just speaking on a panel for vet indexes, and we were kind of talking. Because myself, I was a medic, I got out, got my degree in social work, and I'm actually working in finance now. And so kind of like, had I been stuck in doing medical work, I wouldn't be in my current job now. And so kind of like, what can we honestly do to do more of that? Because I know my firm, we're a veteran-owned firm, and we kind of do a better job at hiring veterans in different career paths. Like we have someone who's a surgical tech, currently an intern as an analyst. And so um, I'm just wondering, how can we ensure like more employers are being mindful of not pigeonholing veterans into the careers that they were doing while on active duty? So with that, I would say networking is going to be your number one um, catalyst there for sure. Um, networking on the veteran side, which is why there are so many veterans, I meet with them their first week in our program. And I say, what do you want to do? And they say, oh, I want to be an analyst just for, and then they network and they meet with people and they learn industries. And then three months later, they come back to me and they're like, actually, I want to be this. And so it's not looking necessarily networking as stepping stones, but more so as an educational basis for both veterans and employers of what really is going to interest them in the long term. Yeah, I, we had an individual at the school yesterday. We were down at Dawson Tech with the utility workers, and um, that was the most interesting conversation ever because they were all like, well, you know, I was in the healthcare, and then I went. I was a technologist, and now they're doing labor work at a utility company like People's Gas. And it was just mind-boggling to see the stages that they go through. To your point, like getting out there and getting. I also, again, I think I encourage industry to do that as well. One of the things that Skillbridge is working on now, which I think is going to be much more helpful. To your point, is we really right now? If you go onto the Skillbridge site. You get a lot of information, but it's kind of like throwing a pin at a map. And we're starting to, I work on the advisory board with the Skillbridge Advisory Board, and um, we're starting to now compartmentalize some of the industry specs versus geographic specs. So since COVID, um, really the, the installations don't want any more people on the installation. So they're allowing um, others to go off installation to, to do their training. So now it becomes a geographic space where is the training happening? Go ahead, Lindsay. A statistic we didn't talk about yet up here is, generally speaking, within service members, around 90% of them will change careers within their first year after military service. So 
with that up to three times within that first year. And so another benefit as a skill bridge is lowering that statistic because they are truly immersing themselves in the career that they are doing and finding their purpose. And so, you know, organizations like 50 Strong, like us, like all the research that is being done, hopefully in the, you know, interim and on the long term is going to lower that so that veterans coming out don't have this glaring statistic of, all right, this job I'm going to get right now or this graduate degree I'm going for is not going to last me a full year. Um, and so just kind of having that positive mindset. Yeah, I think it's interesting even uh, you talked about the GI Bill and, uh, you know, how revolutionary the GI Bill was. And I think at some level what we all have concerns about is that SkillBridge, much like the GI Bill, we don't want to see the service member get taken advantage of. So I think it's really important that we have groups like this and these forums to talk about that responsibility card and how important that is. Um, Candy, do you want, did you want to add something? I think Terrell's going to throw me off the stage in a minute. I could. We all could, I'm sure. Would you like us to wrap it up, Terrell? Terrell's shaking his head, yes. Hey, thanks, everybody. I appreciate thank any last much. words, guys. I think we're done. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Liz, you know, I can't tell you. I just walk up and give it a look like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but thank you guys. Phenomenal panel discussion. Liz, is this yours? But I wanted to make a comment to some of the discussion that just happened here in the panel. I couldn't agree more. So with the SkillBridge program here at the University of Chicago, as I explained to Cody when we had our conversations, we want the service members to be comfortable, right? In a situation where I currently I have a Marine that's looking to uh, participate in our SkillBridge program, and he said that he's most comfortable with data. He's most comfortable doing data analysis. I said, okay, great. I've got partners on campus who would love that type of assistance. I said, well, where are you most uncomfortable? And he goes, people. I don't like dealing with people. I said, great. I'm going to give you another opportunity with the Office for Civic Engagement, possibly you know, engage with the community at large. So the Skill Bridge program is not just simply to enhance the skill sets that you have, but to also tap into those other skill sets that you may be flawed in so that we can make you better. So when you're thinking about transitioning from role to role, in some of the cases where you heard from Liz about individuals switching positions, that you're still prepared if that so happens for you in the past. I'm sorry, it's coming up after your first piece of employment. Now I'm going to put this USB in here. I'm going to invite up our next speaker who I have a lot of conversations with, and I think I'm at a disadvantage because he's on the West Coast and it's typically 11 o'clock at night when I'm talking to Commander Schumacher. And as I tell him all the time, I don't like to talk to a psychologist because they're always trying to analyze me like Matt does. Uh, but Commander Schumacher or Dr. Schumacher is a phenomenal resource in the space of military and veteran wellness and health, law enforcement, et cetera. So we've asked him to present here today to talk about our more injury pieces. So Dr. Schumacher. afternoon everybody let's um, let's just give Terrell a big hand here I mean we're almost at the end and this has obviously been a phenomenal opportunity for all of us um, I wish I had a better sense of who was watching us out in zoom um, but I hope that you're clapping as well because the thing about Terrell is that while he does call for a lot of brief sessions the truth is he's usually calling at like 11 o'clock my time, not his time. And I'm in Los Angeles, which means that's like one in the morning. And he's still trying to get something done, something done for the university, which I feel like he has taken on um, as, as his own. Um, he, he obviously is a huge, huge asset to the city, to the university, to the community of veterans, to the local community. And I, I can't thank him enough for giving me this opportunity. Um, but as a twice graduate of this university, um, I think that we're very lucky to have them, and I don't think they yet know how lucky they are, and I hope that they keep him, um, because I will use your file against you if you try to leave us. 
So, I mean, I'm here to talk about moral injury, right? And moral injury is, um, in some ways, it's, it's kind of the third rail of military mental health. It's not a psychiatric illness, um, probably shouldn't be. Please let me know if I'm wrong. Um, it's extremely ideographic, which means if you really want to know what someone's injury is, you should ask them where it hurts and how you can help. Um, and yet we, we do try. We, we really want to have some sort of generalized definition of this so that we can have programs in place to help people. Um, <clears throat> this is the University of Chicago, so once, once we get the, uh, the Macintosh and the PC to communicate here, I'm going to show you um, some words from Jonathan Shea, who is actually the originator of the term and the phrase. Um, and and we'll, we'll sort of go from there, right? So let me give you just a little bit of background on me because it turns out that one of the only ways I can constrain this topic is to make it a little bit autobiographical. Um, and I'm gonna apologize in advance because um, even though you shouldn't ever do that in a presentation, just the diversity in this room I can't do credit to um, in the amount of time that, that Terrell gave me. You can, you can criticize him for that too. I'll take all the credit and the and the support, but he can be criticized for it. It's just too big a topic, right? So what, what we're gonna talk about in moral injury um, and what I'm gonna talk about from it has to come from a context, right? The world that we live in, the world that the individual lives in. It has to come from a culture, all right? And there are usually multi, um, culture of origin, military culture, where you get out, how you get out, disabled veteran, injured, wounded, none of the above. Um, and then you go into a culture. In this case, we're talking a lot about going into a university culture. Um, <clears throat> and then that last piece that I already talked about, right? There's a self, an identity. The gist of moral injury, which I'll ask you to kind of think about, because I don't think there's probably anybody in this room that doesn't either have personal experience with some kind of moral injury or sense of betrayal, or at least have very, very close, intimate contact with somebody who does. So we kind of know it when we see it. <clears throat> and what I'm gonna try to do with my talk is get you to kind of put yourself in the shoes of someone that's kind of more or less like me if you don't already have somebody that is screaming in your mind that this is what they look like, this is what they act like, this is what they sound like. So foundationally, this is a kind of identity dissonance, a dissonance of the self, because that's our, that's our nexus, right? That's where we experience the world. So <clears throat> what, what Shay will talk about, hopefully, is how we doing? Okay. Okay. Thank you. What what Shay will talk about is this feeling that something just isn't right, a fundamental dissonance, right? In psychology, because that's that's actually what I am as a psychologist, as Terrell said. Um, in psychology, we talk about the self and the world concepts. This is a kind of existential term, which not surprisingly, I'm a little bit existential coming from this university. Self and world concept is the basic idea that from early childhood, we have to figure out, okay, who am I? Who are others? Basically, it's culture, right? And what's the world like? Really young, somewhat rigid, right? Those are kind of like binaries, like all good or all bad, okay? And we, we kind of put our view of the world, our philosophy, um, philosophy of psychology, our philosophy of the world is kind of about those three concepts, right? Are other people all good or all bad? Is the world all good or all bad? And are we all good or all bad? Turns out, um, if you've been paying attention to our culture, we're seeming to regress to that kind of black and white view of everyone and everything. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily go away and we kind of run home to it. Another concept here in development is, um, yeah, again, unfortunately, here's my apologies, the good enough mother, right? This is a, a good psychoanalytic concept. Mine's sitting right there, so she's pretty clearly good enough, right? Um, what, do you, what, do you, what do you get from your immediate culture, right? Your family of origin, your, your community, and that usually is kind of all good or all bad. And the point of this is that in those, in those contexts, like good enough is okay people, your culture, your community will let you down and you have to learn to, to kind of navigate this. So none of this is so extremely foreign to us that the first time something happens in the military that is 
Oh, there we go. Okay. Or something that happens like this, where you're standing trying to spin your wheels and give your talk from memory. No, I'm just kidding. That wasn't that bad. I don't, I don't know about the, for our, our great IT people. We should actually give them a round of applause, too, while we're doing this. But I could have made that easy on them. They know I didn't. Okay, so this is kind of the working title, and I'm going to tell you guys what, this is really the first time I'm giving a talk specifically like this, although I can tell you I've given some talk like this to patients or peers or veterans hundreds of times. One little sticky wicket about um, moral injury I think has been brought up a few times. The first is that it's very little talked about, even in a clinical session with an officer, which I was, until you're out. I mean, the kinds of people that will experience moral injury in the military are folks that are like getting dishonorably discharged, separated against their will, medically retired. I mean, something has gone very wrong. Actually, you'll get moral injury from people that really want out and we won't let them, right? Um, so we've used some of these words and I'm very clearly and purposively playing to stereotype here because a lot of this is very symbolic and our veterans have to look to what? To get their sense of self, right? Self, culture, and world. Love to say society. Did you teach that one? Self culture society? No. Yeah, you did teach it. So I thought. <clears throat> so we have this concept of the wounded or the injured or the disabled veteran, right? We have this concept that, and we'll get into this a little bit, that it's, you can't talk about it. Maybe with veterans, what we like about it is that we don't actually have to talk about it. It's kind of unspoken. You don't have to get into the nitty gritty or tell that one really lousy story. You can tell dirty jokes or, or not really talk about much of anything at all, okay? And then finally, this idea that there's some wandering involved, right? That, that as folks have said, and it's true, I've lived through it. 2018, I got out. In March, I was in Mosul. In um, May, I was no longer in a uniform after almost a decade. And I think six, six to seven days after that, I was in Tasmania with my deployment battle buddy, Colonel John Lane, okay? He's gonna be interesting to talk about because He's got a great new PhD project that he's running um, that has to do with something called GEARS, which actually looks very closely at bringing peers, veteran peers together, and looking at things like culture, what is the culture of the military, and world, what do we all think about the world? So hopefully we'll get there to that. But I'm almost like half done with my time anyway. Terrell, are you gonna give me more? Let's see how we do. He didn't answer that, by the way. Is that how do I uh, push? There we go. Okay, so this is your symbolism, right? And, and for the sake of our discussion, I'd ask you to kind of, sort of think, hey, this, this was me coming out of the military. This, this, the second piece that I didn't say, right, is this was almost everybody watching us withdraw from Afghanistan. Like, what on earth? Okay. Um, <clears throat> is that actually... Nothing like a little bit of stress and a little bit of, you know, Semper Gumby, right? We say Semper Fi in the, the Marines, we say Semper Gumby in the Navy. Yeah. Okay, so this is in a lot of ways like a very symbolic, probably not very accurate to any one person, kind of, it's a symbolism of what moral injury could be, right? It's, there's your ideal self in that mirror some expectation that probably your military service didn't ever live up to, but you may hold that idealized self. Then there's your real life, right? And it may be a little hard to see, but there's <clears throat> some other signs of, quote, failure, right? Maybe some alcohol, um, maybe not a very nice apartment, um, you're missing parts and pieces, okay? And, and to make this personal, as I said I would, um, like I said, I went to this university, 18 years old, I walked onto this campus having absolutely no idea what was gonna happen to me, right? Um, I spent my, my time here, and by the end of it, I actually was tutoring in a place, believe it or not, called Ivy League, right down on 71st and Jeffrey, okay? For the local kids trying to get into schools. I came back the last time, I think, but I'm not quite sure, I mean, probably around 2010, 11, as a relatively new naval lieutenant and psychologist to speak with math students, they didn't care about the uniform, right? They cared about what it meant to be a PhD in psychology, to do research and that sort of thing. And <clears throat> at least as far as I know, there were probably zero um, undergraduates, undergraduate veterans in the college. And there were always some in the graduate school. 
Um, but again, to highlight the kind of work that is being done by Terrell and, and everybody in this room, we're making some pretty big inroads into that, right? Well, <clears throat> here I am back giving a lecture kind of about myself, that's weird, at a place that really formed me with my mother sitting here. She paid for it, right? So th there's a lot of context for you guys to sort of absorb. I'm, I'm actually standing here as a disabled veteran, if you can believe that. That doesn't seem quite right. I don't quite look like that, but I've got a titanium spine. Not from combat, but just from high-risk training, SEER school, that kind of stuff. Um, I have a service dog, and she's actually suffering through the first time she's been without me for more than 24, 48 hours because I got her during COVID. She is a puppy, a foster, and I didn't want someone to give me a service dog, right? I didn't need that, did I? Why would I need that? I can still move around. I don't, I don't need someone to hand me a a dog that's gonna take care of me, I need to do it myself, right? So you're gonna hear a lot of these stereotypes, they're real, um, we do this stuff, we're stubborn. Incoming? Okay, so like, as promised, um, if you can hit that video, um, this is Jonathan's shade, but we've sort of, I've sort of covered most of this, I hope, pretty close, right? The last thing I'm gonna tell you is that I actually do work as an embedded psychologist. Believe it or not, it's called operational psychology. That's my new specialty. I only do this kind of work for the most part with Terrell. But recently, because of the Afghanistan situation, I've been given the handle of our Veterans for Veterans program in the Sheriff's Department. We have over 2,000 veterans um, at the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, which is one of the largest uh, law enforcement agencies. But Better part of 20,000 people working there, right? And you can kind of imagine, as far as moral injury goes, not such a great time to try to be a deputy sheriff, right? Or a Chicago police officer. Um, <clears throat> what I did while we're waiting with them, actually just last week with the sheriff himself, we recorded it, maybe, maybe we'll give you a chance to see it, was I did a debrief with them. And so I asked them pretty much three simple questions. Where, where were you on 9-11? So where did your, military story likely start. And for pretty much all 14 of the guys in the room, that was true. They had, they remembered where they were on 9-11. They remembered how it changed their life. That's the how part. How'd this change your life? Where'd you go? What'd you do? What'd you see? Um, what was it like? Iraq, Afghanistan, not either of those things. And then finally, um, why? What are you doing now? How are you still connected to Afghan veterans, for example? How are you still connected to Afghanistan? Because that was the big topic recently, right? This, the kind of recurrent theme, and we talked about this for 90 minutes with a camera rolling and 14 veterans sitting around a school circle. Um, I know because there are a couple psychologists that I work with who are not veterans. There was 14 stories told in that 90 minutes that nobody ever gets to hear ever, right? Unless you're listening on uh, my phone calls with Terrell. Right, or unless you're, you're somewhere where veterans get together and actually make it a point to talk about this stuff. So, rubber meets road, um, that's kind of my journey, right? I did that, then I come here um, to tap dance up here with you guys. Uh, I hope that the video starts. There's no sweat yet, is there? I'm doing okay. It's not quite seer level discomfort yet. The dissonance is starting to, to build. So, for me, um, there's a lot of psyche, identity, culture, world here, right? Coming back to the university, to be blunt, I mean, Terrell's one of the most important people in actually welcoming me back to the university that really may not have seemed to be very welcoming or have that much interest in me necessarily. That's not entirely true. We have the Veterans Affairs Group, the MAG, and we have, thankfully, Representative Mayor Pat. Um, we, there's stuff that goes on. Um, but this is the first time I've actually come back in a capacity like this with people really wanting to hear um, or wanting the input in the steerage. Um, gonna go? Cool. All right, this is, uh, like I said, we're at the University of Chicago. Let's, let's do the... <laughs> if it weren't the case that I've been through much, much worse in my life, Well, I mean, this may end up being a podcast, actually. I might ask a couple of you to come up here and we start having a conversation about this. Just, you know, be careful about coming up on stage with a shrink that's 
can't get his uh, material to play. I'm going to ask you questions you don't want to answer. So for these veterans, um, Deputy Sheriff, whose primary identity mostly transitioned out, a few still in the reserves with the Guard, but mostly out, right? Um, this was like, um, this is like all engines stop, full right rudder, right? This is a hard right turn on what they thought was gonna happen. I, I'll admit it was the same for me. Like I know people that are there, that were there. I know translators. I actually got involved with a group that was bringing folks over um, and trying to. Um, this was extremely personal, right? So I might as well, so how about you guys start getting up to the microphone and we'll do a little interactive, right? Because you can't scream at me. Like, w what was the feeling watching that happen? Like, okay, we're getting out of here, okay. That doesn't seem, whoa, we're actually literally leaving in the middle of the night. Our partners don't know about it. And as much as we think, maybe. Take this one, yeah, go ahead. As much as our partners, I think, would have maybe been willing to take a different perspective, we just didn't give them that opportunity, right? So, so here, here we are, right? I'm in a room with like 12, 14 guys that not only believe so much in their country and their patriotism that they've served, um, many of them were deputy sheriffs before they were in the military. Some became deputy sheriffs after long careers in the military. One guy that I work with right now is a, was a sergeant major, first in recon, and then he went above that to basically a two-star level as a sergeant major. He's just a deputy. He's not a detective. He hasn't been in long enough, right? Um, another, another friend was sort of barely a Marine, right? He, he got kind of hurt, not necessarily in combat, and he's become an intelligence officer for APTF. He's one of my best partners, right? Um, these folks have put everything on the line for this. And while they're going out and handling our social unrest or they're just handling everyday crime or they're, they're doing whatever it is they can do. Got it? All right, let's try that. Okay. can't talk and type at the same time, so. This is a tough one. Okay, so the long and the short of it is, is that these, these folks, we got volume. So this is Dr. Shea. Dr. Shea was um, working in the, v the VA. Um, wasn't even expecting to do work with with traumatized Vietnam veterans. Um, got kind of, as he would say, sort of half kidnapped, half adopted by that group and started to notice that PTSD itself just wasn't really explaining what was going on with folks, right? That PTSD is actually the only psychiatric condition, realistically, that we can say we know what caused it, right? It was that thing that happened to you. So one of the bigger de uh, d debates in psychiatry, I know it's it would be pretty obvious where I fall on this, is that um, PTSD isn't actually a disease because it's the predictable and normal response to something like that happening to you, right? So whether you're talking about sexual assault, childhood abuse, um, gun, gun violence, or seeing somebody hurt or killed, or almost by definition, war, right? The idea is that something is very not right, it threatens you, um, your sense of personal integrity, so we're getting back to the psyche, right? The idea that you might not survive this. Definition has changed a little bit, but I, I think for, the, for our purposes, since we're not talking P about PTSD, we're kind of talking about everything else, right? That's PTSD. Now, has anybody in this room, just quick show of hands, because I can't see who's online, has anybody met somebody that they know has PTSD as a veteran or otherwise, that, that that's all that's going on with them? Anybody? That's it, that's the only thing? Yeah, I mean, probably not, right? <clears throat> so, so in a way, we, we pathologize the PTSD process um, and, and make the moral injury maybe sound a bit more normal, or like everybody should have it, and I don't think that's true either, right? So everybody's got their own package um, of this, and yeah, that's true. So 
wish you could hear that. Let's go back to my slides. Echoes. There we go. So, you know, you can kind of see all of this, and what what Jay would have said is that this basically, right? There's something really not right about the world. There's something really not right about me. And in the middle somewhere, there's something really not right about us, right? So the world part's pretty easy. It's kind of everything that's not me. The self part's kind of easy. It's it's me. It's my identity. Lots of symbolic meaning, right? Lots of unconscious. And, and I'm not going to get Freudian on you. I also mean things like right now, you're probably not paying attention to what your butt feels like in the chair, but you are because I said so, right? All these processes going on underneath the surface that make up us. For a lot of folks, um, we'll just go with the idea that I, warrior, this, this person that joined the military to go fight and win, um, I'm not as I should be. And then um, <clears throat> in the middle is this concept of culture. Right, and that gets a lot more complex, right? Because it can be the culture of your squad, it can be your, your family, extended family, but culture comes from a Latin word, right? And it really means to cultivate, till. And the one that I like the best was that it also means to honor, right? So there's something about cultivating a person, a psyche, cultivating a world, this interaction between the three ideas. And so really it's hard to talk about anything like moral without thinking about culture and context and an individual and their agency. So this all gets kind of wrapped up together. And I'd argue that, because we are gonna be a little short on time. Oh. Come on. No. Six plus one. So we're gonna go through these quick because I want to push forward and I've said a lot of this stuff already, but this if, if you want to imagine it, because you all can, this is the video of the second plane hitting the second tower. Where were you? What was that feeling in the pit of your stomach? Was the world as it should be in that moment? I don't think so, right? Another one for me personally, it's, it's actually like one of my profile pages right now, is a picture of women in Afghanistan in relatively Western gear with no masks, and it's a series of photographs that goes all the way across to them basically being in full burqas with a child and then blacked out, right? Because to me, whatever was going on in the world that was right or wrong, one thing that wasn't happening in places like Kabul or Kandahar was that, right? Women can go to school. Um, whatever we did or didn't do right, okay, which is there's a lot, some of that wasn't going on. And now I don't know that we have any say, really, in whether that goes on. And it's pretty clear that there are going to be a lot of women in those countries, in that country in particular, that are, are simply going to be virtual non-entities, no self, right? Next one. So this context is critical, right? And so for a lot of veterans, when you start moving from, like, world closer, right, to culture, and very stereotyped, right? But unfortunately, stereotyped images become a part of the culture. This is the stereotype for a lot of veterans. I don't know that any people that aren't in this room, right? Basically, everyone here probably is either themselves a veteran or knows a veteran, and they're all in that sort of one to three percent of the population that I think has been mentioned a couple times here in this conference. For everybody else, okay. Now, that may seem hard to relate to in some ways, but think about what you care about, right? Whether it's your significant other, your spouse, teaching kids, running a veterans transition program. How many times are the other people in your life doing all that stuff, right? On their device, not listening to you. This isn't hard to relate to, right? Okay. But for veterans, at least in part, there's that core mission. We're all here to do a thing, and clearly there was drift and a, a waning of attention. And that, that in itself is a pretty good example of the world's not the way it's supposed to be, but maybe we whether you want to call it the United States, the military, um, Western society, whatever you want to call it, right? Next slide. Now, there's a great uh, video embedded in here that I don't think we should try this time. But Oh, you got it? Yeah, go ahead. Just do it. This is a guy named Chris Hedges. I don't know if anybody's heard of Chris Hedges, but he's cool. I have to do it? Oh, yeah. gotcha.
So just listen to this a little bit, and I want you to listen specifically. Uh, Chris, to let God. me just say I couldn't get it to work, and now it won't stop. Chris Hedges is a guy with a lot, journalist in the New York Times with a lot of experience in combat zones and things like that. He's also an extremely erudite, learned guy, University of Chicago kind of guy. And I want you to listen to the kind of things he talks about. I felt your words are perspicacious and brilliant and true. Here we are, a small group of people. You know, get the word out, get the word out. But with the immensity of the media just drowning us, how do you get that word out? How do you demonstrate to more Americans of what <laughs> that uh, triumvirate is doing in the White House. The problem in wartime is that it always begins with the destruction of culture, of our own culture. And the most effective way the state has to accomplish that is by taking away our language. And It gives us the words and the cliches by which we speak about the experience we're undergoing so that it becomes very hard to think outside the box. And these, I don't own a television because I don't want those phrases pounded into my brain on 24-hour news cycles, the war on terror, Countdown with Saddam, showdown with Iraq. Once you rob language, once they give us the words by which we have to speak about what we're undergoing, it becomes almost impossible to express the disquiet that we feel, and I think that many of us feel. We saw this in Bosnia, and in, in a place like Mostar, where you had young men who had grown up together, who had gone to school together, attended each other's weddings, slept in each other's houses, sitting in trenches often a few yards apart where at night they could still speak to each other, killing each other. Yet they didn't have the words by which they could express what it was they're doing. When you ask them why they were fighting, they spat back at you those kind of cliches that, had been, that were pounded into them day after day after day after day. And I'm not picking on the Bosnians because now we're the same. And what it does is turn the other into an object. It denigrates the other. It turns the other into a caricature. And when we go to war, of course, the other side is doing the same. So that until you can recreate an authentic language, and that has a lot to do with allowing authentic culture, which is always about self-examination and self-critical to again become ascendant or at least have its proper place in a society, you are rendered mute. I think we've all become in wartime like Othello, who's so consumed by jealousy that at the final, one of the final moments before he turns to kill Desdemona, he, he says, goats and monkeys, goats and monkeys. The most poetic man in Venice a man who wooed not only his love, but the state with words. And that's why in Bosnia or in Cyprus, you do not have peace. You have the absence of war. In Bosnia or with the Turks and Greeks in Cyprus, people learn, students learn different histories, both of which are a lie. And this is, of course, touches upon the brilliance of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, where Although the torturers and the killers of the apartheid regime were given an amnesty, to do so they had to confess their crimes. And what they were doing is returning to South Africans' language, a narrative, a common narrative by which you can build and maintain peace. And it's always the same disease. Uh, I woke up a few weeks after 9-11 and I looked around New York with people driving down the street waving big obnoxious flags, and I thought we've all become the Serbs. Um, and that's what's so terrifying about war. It doesn't matter whether I'm in Argentina or Israel or Bosnia or El Salvador. It's the same disease, and we have it. Anybody check the date on that recording? Okay, doke, right? So, I mean, really too thick 
deep symbolic and cultural concepts that I'm sort of talking about here. One is like, war's bad, okay? Um, I actually let that play an extra minute because I want you guys to know there's, there's a, a sort of kind of like legitimate expert in peace and reconciliation sitting right here in front, right? Someone that understands why this is all important and one of the reasons that we all get together and talk so much is because these things are sort of like two sides of the same coin, right? Cultures get torn apart. Language stops working. People just don't communicate anymore. What I really liked is his reference to um, Othello saying goats and monkeys, right? It's like how many veterans have that experience where they're trying to explain this to somebody that's, God forbid, somebody that's like on the other side of the conflict, right? No chance, right? But someone that's shared a bed with them because they're a spouse, someone that has been um, in their life, a, a parent, a sibling, very, very difficult, right? And one of the first things that war does is disrupt that process. Now, are any of these conversations possible for veterans and people in the military while they're in? Are they possible until we actually get out of Afghanistan? I don't know. I don't know. It probably depends on the individual. But I can tell you that when people would come to me with severe problems in the military while I was on active duty, this I could think these thoughts and read these things. But even I was struggling with them, right? Wars, wars can be just, right? We're not totally wrong here. So <clears throat> I'm pretty much at the end here um, of at least the time that I have. So we may have to just try to figure out a way to do a little bit more of this. But what I'm going to actually do, because the last piece of this, this is the culture, right? The idea that the culture is wrong. And then the last bit, if you can switch back to the slides for just a second, I'm going to show one of them. Forward one, please. Sorry. Well, you see what I was going to do? I was going to show you a picture of Abu Ghraib, right? That's culture. That's us. Whoa, that's not the way it's supposed to be. I was also going to show you a picture of, uh, you know, the two helicopters, right? Saigon, right? Um, I always get confused. Is that a 53 that was taken off from the top of the roof of Saigon and then again in uh, Afghanistan? Right, so these are images of things that went really, really wrong. We were supposed to fix them, right, and get them, get them right. Have you ever, ever anybody ever heard of something called a repetition compulsion in trauma, right? The sense that if you don't process, if you don't understand what happened, if you don't gain some sense of healing and recovery, that you just repeat it until you endeavor to get that. Do we have a cultural repetition compulsion in some ways making the same thing happen? I don't know the answer to that, but it's an interesting question. One more, please. So I think we've made this point. I think we can move on. One more. So, you know, obviously moral injury is really about this part, right? And I'm going to leave it, uh, I'm going to leave it to you. I'll show you the, the Jonathan Shea video. Please listen to the one. Um, I may even give you a few minutes of it here if Terrell will let me. But um, imagine you're a warrior, whether it's yourself, a good friend. Um, this gets really personal, right? I mean, it's hard to kind of explain. I just sort of told you my personal story about how being here is so personal. Well, I was texting uh, while we were sitting there listening to that talk with a master gunnery sergeant at MARSOC who's going through the Honor Foundation, which I am also a graduate of. Thank you to you guys as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm a disabled veteran, so I get VA benefits, kind of, begrudgingly. No. I mean, it's hard, right? It's not easy. I was talking to him about Skillbridge. He's been talking about Skillbridge for three months, by the way. So if you, uh, whether it's the Honor Foundation, which he's trying to be a part of, or whether it's because he's, uh, he's one of those special ops types, um, I don't know. But he's a guy with over 20 years and a purple heart, a through and through right here. Didn't touch the bone, believe it or not. Force recon, scout sniper, instructor, now teaching at the, uh, um, the Raider schoolhouse in the three shop guys that know what that means, I'll let you do the math. This is a guy without a college degree, 20 years. Okay, but that's why I'm texting right now because I have Thanksgiving dinner from time to time with my friend Mark, right? That blurring of the lines between officers and enlisted, doesn't matter, at least not to me, not after. Soft guy with a THF kind of a network, yep, that's different, right? There's a different kind of network for these folks. And all of that is really, really critical to lead up to, imagine, imagine your veteran, yourself. One more, please.
well, there's a couple people that we might, we know one of these guys, right? What was the moment when he was most not the guy we saw yesterday, right? Who's the guy on the right? That's one of the Marines. In fact, it's the last Marine still in the hospital after our, the bombing in Kabul. This is about a week old. I don't, I don't know that he's still there, but from what I can see, it doesn't look like he's going to be able to stay on active duty. It looks like he's going to get a med board, and he will be. One more slide, please. That's where he'll be, right? It, it, maybe not in that way, but he'll be looking in the mirror. Two months ago, I was this. Now I'm what? Okay. Give me one more forward. Um, so this is really, you know, kind of the crux of it for, for us all, right? This is the level that I'm supposed to be talking about, and I'm going to have to let you guys do some of your own homework and your own reading, and I'll give you the, I'll give you the links. I, I actually just recently with uh, USC and their Center on uh, Veterans and Families published an article on moral injury. I'm not even going to bring it up. It's way too complicated. I mean, it just is. It's not going to hit you where you live. I think it's a great article if you're ready. But the, the question is, how do we treat it? Do we treat it with psychiatry, psychiatrist? Probably not. Psychologist? I, I don't think so. All right. It's, it's got a lot to do with thinking about this recreation of context, culture, and self. There's a transition to be made, right? You have to get somewhere and have to start seeing a new mission, something else that you can do. And in the middle of that is a culture. And that's what I think Terrell and, again, a number of people in this room are doing such a great job of creating here right now. So let's go just a little bit backwards. Give me uh, at least one more forward to gears. One more. Well, so that's, that's the joke, right? The lightning lube. Didn't get me any laughs at all. So, so we don't really know how to treat moral injury, I don't think. We've got some thoughts, and it's a guess. And there's lots of people with lots of degrees and lots of experience. I think you almost, you know, it's kind of a cliche of more ideographic or existential kinds of therapy, but I think you kind of have to create the therapy for each person. And I don't think that the primary is a psychologist or a therapist. I'm, I'm sorry. I actually think it's peers, okay? So rather than wait until someone can get to the point where they can explain to a therapist, even maybe one that wore a uniform and deployed four times, why not use the culture? Why not recreate the tribe? A lot of what we talk about, right? We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can have a tribe here. There's nothing wrong with it, right? We don't have to talk about all the ways that we're broken. We can talk about the things we still know how to do and do well. And then we can have the conversation about why that might not work with civilians or professors or spouses, right? We can learn some things about those social skills. So one more. And one more. You're going to have to, sorry, one more. <laughs> and one more. So all of this this stuff, uh, this is from my friend John, the one I, like I said, this is my deployment buddy. We talk on Zoom for two hours just about every Saturday night. And we started when, when I was kind of screwed up and went to see him in Tasmania because I needed to get as far away from America and everything else when I had just gotten back from Mosul and had about a week to separate because they left me there an extra month. Okay. But <clears throat> I'll let you read some of this on your own. I don't think you need me to read it to you. But Instead of thinking about an individual who needs to transition, maybe we think about somebody who needs to find a tribe. Instead of somebody who needs to um, believe that everything about them that is PTSD or that is lacking um, as far as functioning as a civilian is, is wrong. I, how many people, you can do this internally, have heard somebody say, I went to the VA and they told me I had to just transition back to being a civilian. Anyone wanna tell me how to do that? You're going to be a civilian now. That's it. You don't take any of the good with you? How's that supposed to work, right? So these conversations need to be had, and they need to be had with people that kind of understand. So I told those veterans, the ones that I mentioned earlier at the Sheriff's Department, we were talking about all these hot issues, things they won't talk to their spouses about, right, things that they probably haven't talked about and needed to badly. So even with a camera in their face, they talked about it with the sheriff, their boss, who's also a veteran. We talked about this stuff. Um, and they ultimately said, well, what's, what's our mission, right? So most of the guys, I'd say 60% were part of our Vets for Vets group. So I laid it on the line for them. I said, our mission is to, who are we missing today? Who's, who's not here that should be, right? Go get them, right? Who isn't here um, that can't be, right? Where are they? 
who did we have, and we had at least two that I know of, who were actually there in, in Kabul, but neither one of them were there, and I didn't know about them. Okay, so there's work to be done on this, right? There, there's work for veterans to do in ways that we know how, and that's part of it. That was my first challenge. And my second challenge was, um, if you can't tell your story, even if it takes a lot of work and even if you need a lot of help, if you can't tell your story to somebody who wasn't there and isn't a veteran, you might not be back yet, okay? So, like I said, th this is a whole other talk on gears, right, on this idea that we could create almost like a, a peer, a more skilled peer group that is focused on the social skills required to sort of fake it till you make it in the real world to do that skill bridge job, but also be able to do what's asked of you socially to connect, to be less of a veteran when you're at work, maybe to do it at home. Um, Jono's data so far, um, and I'm definitely gonna be lobbying for him to get here for one of these things one of these times, his data so far show that he can get just about the same amount of symptom reduction as a PTSD intervention, like prolonged exposure or uh, and this is in a group that is led by a peer, like a train the trainer kind of peer, right? They've been trained in all, but they're just another veteran. So we talk about social psychology, and that, this will be my last point. Listen, we're all what I would call um, biosocial creatures, right? Like we've got bodily needs, and those are at the bottom of the hierarchy, like, like was said before, right? Um, some of those things are critical. You don't start talking about these other things until you're not in the combat zone, you're not going back and things like that. But we, we create our identity socially. Veterans, um, how many people go back to the Middle East in some sort of contract role because they function just fine there? Is that a pathology or is that actually a strength? I don't know, maybe a little bit of both, right? But either way, we have to start taking some of these things seriously that what we're doing um, maybe is fighting the last war. We tend to do that a little bit, but fighting the last war and how these things need to work. And again, my last little thank you for this, Terrell. I mean, this is, a, this is just as much a game changer, in, in my opinion, as to how the, the academy and the public thinks about veterans and how to engage them, as SkillBridge sounds like it is for the military um, and, and for the, um, the private sector and jobs, okay? so that's. I commend everyone for being here and their work, and for the folks that I can't see online, um, don't share the video. Just let me do this again sometime. No, um, <clears throat> reach out, my, my information is around and, and Terrell knows how to get hold of me. Happy to help in any way I can. And again, thank you for your service, thank you for your time, and thanks for being here. me off. You mean that was all crystal clear and none of you have any questions? You can find me at the barbecue. I don't, I don't see anybody with any questions. I think they're all just feeling really sorry for me right now. They just want me off. Like the, the dissonance is... We got one. See? We were talking about this yesterday. Don't ask. <laughs> Um, I think you are doing fantastic work with this part of uh, the difficult realm that veterans fall into with moral injury because the first time we heard about that term, it lit a light bulb off that there was so much pain that he had from his service that he didn't have the language to understand what was wrong with him. Mm -hmm. And it actually was a game changer for him to let go of so much of the hurt that he had. And I think you hit the nail on the head that that community part and connecting with your peers is a huge part of how the service members can really move through their moral injury and past their moral injury and have it become um, not this thing hanging over their head, not the shadow anymore. So I just, I wanted to make the comment that I really appreciate the work that you are doing because it is so important. Um, we're actually gonna try and meet up with another veteran that we met at a retreat that the same thing happened to him as well, that he heard this 
talk from General Mokiyamo, who works heavily with moral injury and getting that awareness. Um, and he had to leave the room and broke down into tears and said, that's finally it. So I think it's just, personally, I've seen it not just from my husband, but from multiple veterans when they hear this term and when they finally can put that language to what is happening to them, um, it's life changing. So thank you. Well, thank you. You've been actually extremely brave here. Um, and I appreciate that. Do you remember the question I asked you about what was missing? Yes. I think this too. What you said, I, I, I can't remember it right this second, but I, I, it was important. It was, it was really important, but um, I think it was outreach to families. I think you said that there wasn't as much support for the family, right? And that's gonna come around here in a second too, because um, like I said, dangerous to get in front of a microphone with a psychologist, but you have been very, very courageous. And so here's my, my couple questions. You didn't know your husband when he went, became a soldier or when he went to war or when he got hurt, right? Correct. Okay. Um, do you relate with any of that stuff that you may have some moral injury? Oh, for sure. Okay. So for it's sure. It's, it's not it's just right? the service member. Yeah. It travels, um, right? It's when I heard that and there's times that I can think back when things have happened that I'm like, yep, that's there too. Yeah. The family can potentially feel that sense of betrayal. The family can feel the sense that something's terribly wrong. Heck, I mean, I've been there. The family can feel like this isn't the person that I knew before and there's something wrong. So really, again, appreciate your courage. I think we should all give you a round of applause too, but it, it happens to families and it happens in many ways. Thank you. So, anyone else? Now that I just made clear what I'm gonna do is who's gonna walk to that microphone. Okay, thank you everybody. You guys see why my conversations with Commander Schumacher are always the best. Again, you know, I love talking to him. I hate talking to him because he makes me take a deeper look at myself uh, when I'm at home. Uh, but we want to move forward. Uh, and sorry about the delays for those who are attending virtually. But I want to give this next speaker an opportunity to get through her entire presentation as well. Um, this year, again, I've had the privilege of serving uh, with the SVA Leadership Institute and I actually had an opportunity to serve with the deck speaker uh, as the two mentors for this particular group, uh, Ms. Fontaine Segal, who is actually a board member for the Student Veterans of America's national chapter. So I invite her up to speak about the SVA and what they do for our student veterans across the, internationally, forgive me, not just across the country. I'm hoping that my presentation goes smoothly, but definitely Dr. Shoemaker did an excellent job improvising. I don't know if I'll be that good, so I'm just praying everything works. Um, let's see. And is there a way, Terrell, that I could see the presentation on the laptop as well? Okay, I got you. Okay. All right, so, um, Thank you, Terrell, for this, this invitation. Um, so I just wanted to talk about Student Veterans of America, which is an organization close to my heart. Um, I started with the organization at my campus at the University of Houston. Um, I was just a, um, just a regular student uh, transitioning from the Navy. Um, I served six years in, in the Navy and ended up moving to a totally different state. I'm originally from Indiana, decided to move to Houston, Texas. Um, and so it was an interesting transition moving somewhere where you don't know anyone there. I'm not going to school with, you know, people I went to high school with or, you know, in my local community. Um, so just starting fresh um, was just an interesting time. And what helped with um, the barriers that I had was um, Student Veterans of America. And Student Veterans of America champions those who've served 
and empowers them to succeed in higher education through a community of more than 1,500 on-campus chapters. Let's see where she starts. So the mission is to act as a catalyst uh, for student veteran success by providing resources, network support, and advocacy to, through, and beyond higher education. And with this mission focused on empowering student veterans, SVA is committed to providing an educational experience that goes beyond the classroom. Let's see. Okay. Um, so with 1,500 on-campus chapters in 50 states and three countries overseas, this network represents more than 750,000 student veterans. Now, how did it start? It started with, you know, the, I'm sure everyone knows the GI Bill um, 77 years ago. Um, now, when we were ending World War II, um, they realized you, we were gonna have 16 million service men and women unemployed, and that would have um, hurt our, our country tremendously, hurt our economy, um, send us into another depression. And so the GI Bill was created to make sure American veterans were given access to jobs, education, and housing. And so it really you know, saved our country. Um, the GI Bill was extended um, several times. 2008, we got the post 9-11 GI Bill. That's one that um, I used to, for my education. And then um, most recently, we have the Forever GI Bill that was passed in 2017. But who are today's veterans? So today's veterans, we have about a million that are using their GI Bill benefits. And um, currently, about 750,000 um, on campuses and universities at, at this moment. Or, and also attached to an S SBA chapter. Now, when we talk about those barriers to access, um, our, our student veterans are not the traditional students. So, we're a lot older. 46% um, have children. More than half are married. We have single parents. Um, a lot are working full time or part time. I was in that that number. I um, had to work part time while going to school for petroleum engineering, which a lot of engineering students were not able to do. So that was one barrier. I was married, a lot older than the 18 and 19 year olds in my class, hard to relate to. Um, definitely what helped was finding that peer group on campus, which was Student Veterans of America and our veteran service office on campus. Finally, I felt that familiarity with other uh, students who've gone through the experiences that I have gone through, who were around the same age, a lot of the same experiences. So despite these challenges, these barriers to access that a lot of us faced, what, what was awesome is that Despite these barriers, student veterans are succeeding on college campuses at a higher rate and with higher GPAs. So the average student veteran, 3.41 GPA compared to 2.8 of the traditional student. The student veteran success rate, 72% compared to 67%. We're earning bachelor's degrees in some of the top fields, STEM, health, business, so just like we talked about changing that narrative and changing the language around veterans, you know, a lot of times we hear broken veterans and PTSD. That is true. But at the same time, we're succeeding. We're trying to change the narrative to show that veterans are succeeding at higher rates. Veterans are leaders on their campus. And Student Veterans of America is training and empowering those leaders. So currently, um, 1,500 student-led chapters throughout 
the United States and in three countries, representing 754,000 individual student veterans or military affiliated students. Every year we have our national conference, which I'll talk about a little later. Last NatCon, um, over 5,000 attendees. And a lot of the work of SVA is also in research, analyzing 1.8 million post 9-11 graduates. This is helping us to um, leverage national policy and programming. And recently, SVA um, was part of con conceiving the Forever GI Bill, which has given access to 1.1 million students um, distributing $13.5 billion annually. So through programs, research, and advocacy. Um, so some of the programs include our regional summits where our chapter leaders are trained on organizing on campus and their strategic programming. Then research as, as we just talked about. Um, we have an annual SVA census, basically showing us how I showed you the statistics of who veterans are now and what they need. Um, advocacy, we have, um, we have our national headquarters in DC and they actually go on Capitol Hill, they advocate for our student veterans. Am I pushing a couple times in? Okay. So at the end of every summer, the regional summit, um, that was one of the first, um, one of the first events that I went to where I was able to come up with a whole business plan for my chapter at the University of Houston. Um, it was through that that we created effective programs and um, activities for our student veterans. Also activities to connect with other, other um, organizations on campus, not just veterans. Basically forming a peer network and healing through camaraderie and letting other organizations know who are student veterans. Then with our Leadership Institute, I have been an attendee of the Leadership Institute, which was life-changing for me as well. Um, basically, it's a leadership program designed to push veterans um, into discovering their own identities um, as leaders as they go into the civilian workforce. So for me, it was being surrounded by like-minded veterans. Um, sometimes on your campus, you only have a few veterans who are really putting in the work in their chapter. Um, and you might get discouraged as a student leader being the only one organizing or showing up to events or trying to make things happen. But going to the Leadership Institute, the top 1% one, one of student leaders from the nation came together and um, being around like-minded individuals who were um, enthusiastic of making their chapters work and um, making, having them succeed was an awesome experience. And I also go back every year and I'm a mentor for the Leadership Institute now and able to see how it changes um, those student veterans' lives after that. Like, I get to see them on Facebook throughout the years and see what they're doing and how they're still staying connected and engaged with one another. Um, it's a great, great network. Washington Week. Um, I have not been a part of this one, but it's where student veterans join the SVA national team um, for Washington Week. And they go to um, Capitol Hill um, and the White House. They talk with our politicians, talk about veteran policies. 
um, they get to you know, meet face to face with those who are shaping our nation. Um, and finally, the National Conference is the largest convening of student veterans anywhere in the world. This is where we have employers, um, chapter leaders. Um, the, the past couple years, we had our um, Secretary of the Navy, or I'm sorry, the Secretary of the Veteran Affairs. Um, it's where chapter, our, we train our chapters and stakeholders, um, convene our network and sharing ideas and resources, and we frame the possible for student veterans, given their experience, experiences and transformative power of education. Um, at NatCon, that's where I really got in, involved in the organization and just seeing the potential, seeing my potential. Um, it's just something when you get to be around um, your peers and kind of get that push of what's possible. Um, a lot of times we're, we're just stuck in trying to transition, trying to make, you know, something in this world when we're just, we've just been snatched from what we got used to for the last couple years. Um, and so now we're seeing possibilities. Now we're given the tools to really go out and make a difference in our communities and have a new mission. Okay, that was the end. Um, so, I just want to encourage you guys, if you haven't been to a national conference, um, I really encourage you guys to, to go, whether you are still a student veteran, an alumni, faculty, it's such a rich experience. Um, so many resources and just networking. Um, Phenomenal speakers, uh, phenomenal, you know, um, we just had like uh, a recording artist, um, so performances, it's just, it's, every year gets better and better. And I, and I thought they had topped out at the first NatCon that I went to back in uh, 2016. They had, um, at the time, Vice President Biden was the keynote speaker and just just the greatest time and i was like whoa sign me up how do i stay involved what you know and literally every year they top it and it's, it's just phenomenal what the sba staff does um so i just you know want to thank sba staff they work tirelessly to provide resources network support and advocacy to ensure student veterans can effectively connect, um, expand their skills, overcome these barriers to access that we talked about, and ultimately achieve their greatest potential. So, thank you. Any questions about Student Veterans of America? Oh, so NatCon will be um, at Walt Disney World January 6th through the 8th. Um, you can get more information at studentveterans.org. Like I say, definitely check it out. If you have not been, you will be amazed. Um, so, any other questions? I don't. I don't need a like a perfect number, but how much? Uh, in at the at, at NatCon, how many are your attendees students, and how many of them are higher ed professionals, businesses, organizations? What's the you know? Is it eighty? The breakdown. Students? Yeah. Um, I would probably say 80% students, um, and then there, there is a lot of um, faculty or um, people in the veteran space that do attend as well, um, and we're, we're probably 10% alumni. Yeah, mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Thank you.
Well, Terrell has gone off for the very important business of getting the barbecue up and running, so please don't forget to head out back there after we've concluded today. I just wanted to very briefly close first by thanking everyone that's supported um, putting this on, the International House here at the University of Chicago, certainly all of our um, fellows in the back there helping us with the technology portion of it. Thank you so much for keeping things going. Um, and of course, all the panelists and speakers from both yesterday and today. Um, I was personally, I just it was a really gratifying experience. Um, it's nice to connect and reconnect with you and really hear some of the important conversations and, and perhaps more importantly, some of the important actions that are being taken in this field. And, and I'm hoping this is just, you know, sort of part of a growing wave of, of interest and investment in, in such an important um, area. So thank you. Um, I think that's it. Oh, we probably should thank Terrell, yeah. <laughs> Who's done a thing or two to throw all of this together as well and the Robert McCormick Foundation for their generous support, both of last year's symposium, the research we did following it, and this year's event as well. So we're very grateful as that of that. So with that, thank you so much for spending a couple of days together here, and we hope to see those of you that are here in the picnic, and for those of you that are online, you should come next year so you can join the picnic. So <laughs> thank you so much.